Do you watch a lot of horror films? I try to keep up with them if I can, yeah. Do you watch more, let's say, retro? Or do you watch more current? In terms of retro uh, horror movies, I think I've, I've covered the basics that I have to cover. I don't know if I passionately consume them the way I should. I try to keep up with the modern ones that are coming out because it would be embarrassing not to. Um, but with the old ones, I would say maybe I've seen under 100 of them, 50 of them or something. Not like as many as a lot of my fellow horror filmmakers watch for sure. So is there anything about the older films that you get nostalgic about or miss? I mean, I was just watching a bunch of old um, Humphrey Bogart film, uh -huh. and it was just so wonderful how you could just be focused on the acting and the dynamics between the characters. I realize that's not horror. A lot of them were mystery, but it feels like so much of that is taken away these days. And why, do you think? Um, maybe just focus on really cool effects uh -huh. and, and having sort of larger-than-life sort of experiences, where I kind of miss that, like, quiet story, but hey, that's uh -huh. just me, I don't know. That is probably the case that with the older movies, people had more patience and there was less reliance on the spectacle, right? Because the effects just weren't as advanced as that. So it had to be storytelling and it had to be acting and all that. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That, oh, that's interesting. I like spectacle. Yeah, that makes, you know, that makes sense. Maybe we should remake some of the old ones. Not just the old slasher movies, not just make Friday the 13th for the 50th time, <laughs> but do some of the quiet old ones, see how an audience would react to that. Be an what? experiment. Do you think that, so that's a product of just how it's a spectacle every time we turn on the internet? You know, there's so many things, notifications. I think so, with Netflix and all the patience of people, I think it has been, become so much shorter. It's like, get to the point, I'll give you, it used to be 10 minutes, I think now it's probably a minute. I see that with myself, if I flip through Netflix, something amazing better happens within the first 90 seconds or there are 2,000 other you know, movies and shows and whatever on offer and I'll switch to one of them. And I think that's become more and more extreme through the years. I don't know where that's going to go in the next 10 years. It's going to be interesting. What do you miss about cinema from, from whether it's 10 years ago? I mean, you can definitely see in increments like the 2000s, there was definitely, it seemed like a different style. Um, versus 1970s, 80s? I mean, what I miss about the 70s is that there was a real um, courage for devastating endings. I think we talked about that last time during the interview, that there's such a thrill in watching a movie and you genuinely don't know if the protagonists are going to be okay or not, which I think was very much the case in the 70s. You didn't know. They would just kill a protagonist off in the last minute and you'd just sit there devastated. You know, they don't do that so much anymore. They didn't. I think they lost that during the 80s. And then in the 90s, it was always more, everything had to be kind of wrapped up kind of neatly, all the way down to seven, which I think had that negative ending um, at some point. And then the studio tested it and said, the audience can't process it. So we need some kind of positive wrap up on the whole thing. I would love if that came back, if that unpredictability and that kind of danger came back from the 70s. Let's see. Do you think too, because now there's the opportunity for a franchise, and so if you, if you kill off that beloved character, then? I think the franchise is one of the considerations in the, in the bigger movies. But then, then the franchises have carried on with different characters. But I think we've also what has happened is the anthology idea that we've been much more, become much more comfortable with. Um, that you can now carry on a franchise, the Saw franchise, let's say. Jigsaw has been dead for five movies or something, and they <laughs> still kind of make movies with it. And it's so much name recognition now that it's maybe not even that much um, attachment to the protagonist anymore as it used to be. Thinking about it now, right? Because oh, it's more a marketing, because what's being marketed is the name and the franchise, and not like in The Conjuring, there's now the whole Conjuring universe which pumps up movie after movie after movie, but it's not even that there's one protagonist that is pulled all the way through. You know, people are less attached to the characters than they are to the, the marketing of the franchise, which is maybe also a difference to what it used to be like, where people got more attached to the protagonist. Yeah, we were just interviewing another filmmaker the other day, and they talked about how in the Nightmare on Elm Street movies that Freddy almost became a parody eventually. Mm -hmm. Because it, it just, it was like this you know, sort of gimmick all of a sudden. So that's right. interesting. But that's maybe, a, maybe that's okay because it's a joyful parody. People were <laughs> such fans of his 
that then it's okay to make them that much bigger than life. Same for, I think, Evil Dead 2 is a total comedy, whereas Evil, Evil Dead is kind of more serious. I think once you have people on board, I totally understand the impulse to kind of take everything over the top and see where it goes. It's just hard to come back from that, obviously. Once you've gone there, how do you rein it back in unless you make a true uh, remake and restart the show like Halloween did or something like that. Have you gone to any horror cons? No. No, but I want to. They're actually, I was surprised. Uh, people are actually very polite. I, I you know, yes. uh -huh. They were very polite uh -huh. and like there wasn't, uh, at least the ones that I attended, there wasn't this weird sort of LA like competitive vibe where I've gone to other things that are maybe more, would say, um, high culture or whatever, and that's not the case. I just found that very interesting. Yeah. I have that with horror fans that they, the ones that I talk to are very soft spoken, are very smart, are very gentle. Everything that you would imagine they wouldn't be from the cliche, you know, it's interesting. Yeah, I know. I wonder what that is. You think that whatever, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's probably a million ways to analyze why, but I was just taken aback. I was surprised. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What makes you a great horror director? What makes me a great horror director? I don't know if I am a great horror <laughs> director. Sorry uh, to put that, <laughs> that label on you here. What, what I hope makes me a, a passable horror director um, is the same thing that I hope would make me a, a passable director in general, which is focus on story, focus on character, which is so lame to say because it's such a cliche, but it's just so true. That's, that's what makes uh, an experience for the audience. And then the, the shock and the horror and the gore of it all, that's all kind of ornamentation on top, but the, the basic um, structure still has to be a very solid foundation in storytelling. And that means to always be very aware where the audience is at any given moment in time. What is the information they're processing right now? What are the emotions that they are might be fighting that might be raging inside of them. Hopefully, if you've done if you've done your job, um, I think it's almost like resource management in terms of the audience's energy, attention, and emotional involvement. I think that's kind of the backbone of any directing. You know, it starts with the writing. Obviously, the, that a script has a certain structure to kind of it's like this roller coaster. Um, that the audience is being taken on, and then you are, as the director, the person that takes the blueprints of that roller coaster, buy, builds the roller coaster, and then finesses the roller coaster, always with the audience kind of simulated in your head, which is really hard because you've sat so long with the script and with the characters that you have almost lost touch with what it's like to experience it for the first time. And yet you are building it for people that are experiencing it for the first time. Which to me, the whole, um, which is why the whole test viewing process that I know many filmmakers despise, to me is actually a really important one. It's depressing, and I want to kill myself every time after a test screening because you get all these problems that you didn't even know you had, and your film had, and you felt pretty good about it. And after a test screening, you are sure to feel shitty about your film. But it's so important because it's the first time that an audience that sees it for the first time tells you their opinion. And if you don't listen, you're kind of lost. And that took me a while to figure out. So I would, I, I, I would hope that what makes me a good director is how closely I can simulate the audience experience in my mind. Yeah, years ago, I had gone, I'd gone to a few of those test screenings where people would just hand you the passes you know, on the street. And they always made sure that you weren't in the, the entertainment industry. industry. Right. And I found that very interesting because you're going to have a different perspective. And this was probably like 15 years ago. So my perspective on storytelling would be much different than it is right, now. Right. But yeah, I remember just the detail of why they wanted to know certain things, yeah. the rating. It's always with these test screenings, what's so interesting to me is that by the time that you do the test screening, you've worked on it for so long that you're obsessing over these details. Oh, there's that one take in there where she doesn't fully turn. It destroys <laughs> the movie. And then you test screen the thing. And not only do they not have a problem with that take, they have a problem with m m something much more basic and much more fundamental in the first act, which is like, oh, I don't think this should be a horror movie. This should be a musical. And you go like, what are we talking? <laughs> but that is how people consume these things. And same for me when a friend gives me, let's say, a rough cut. 
and I give notes on that. Do I then want to see the final movie? If I do, I always have the feeling that's the same as the rough cut. Of course, if I had sat in the editing room with my friend doing the notes, I would know that this is a completely different animal from what I saw two months ago. But as in, just as an audience, I take in what the rough story is, what the rough conflicts are, whether I like the characters or not, and I have no real interest in whether that take is a little bit underdeveloped or overexposed or whatever. You know, it's the broad brush strokes. And that is something you have to try to get back to as a director when you test screen your movie. And that's really hurtful. It really is a dangerous, difficult process to kind of get back into that mindset and then flip back out of it and be detail oriented again. It's kind of a schizophrenic process a little bit. Yeah, I wonder how much focus groups and things like that, whether it's product testing or whatever, are really that helpful or the fact that you know you were there to, quote, pick something apart. Right. I wonder, I wonder, yeah, if, if you really... Well, my test screening that is not really that big marketing test screening. It's more like a group of my friends that see it for the first time, where I know exactly what their tastes are, what they like, what they don't like. And if someone loves, let's say, this, this kind of scene, but has a problem with that scene, then I better listen to what that person has to say, because there's probably something in it, which to me is different from a big marketing kind of survey where I don't know who these people are. There's still something valuable in it to hear from the general audience kind of a thing, but it's much more valuable to have 10 hand-picked people that you also, if you do a couple of test screenings, different stages of your film, that you have very much in mind whom to invite when, who is the most helpful when, whom do I want to hear from right after the shoot when I just show them some dailies. Is that the most helpful for that person and how that person gives feedback? Or is it more helpful to edit the movie, polish it, and then let that person see the cut right before I lock it. You know, there are those people and those people, and at some point after you've done it a couple of times, you kind of know your, know your feedback people and when to go to whom. I listened to a panel of um, crime writers speak about things, and they had a question from uh, the moderator, and she asked, what scares you? You write about crime, you write about some very gruesome things, but in life, what actually scares you? And they said, the well being dry, not being able to come up with new ideas. Uh -huh. That they, was scary. They all said that. That was a, they, yeah. Uh, I think three out of the panel. The other one said mimes. <laughs> <laughs> true. <laughs> that is true. Um, what scares me? I think that is probably a very writer-oriented answer. The well-being dry, because as a director, you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to start with the empty page where, if you don't have an idea, nothing happens. You know, I always have something to work off of, and then it's just a translation process. So that's why you don't hear about director's block much. Yeah, there's writer's block, but director's block is not so much um, a thing. Um, I mean, down that path, my biggest fear would be to, to, to be mediocre, I think, in what I have to say to the world and not to have anything to say to the world. I have that in a, in a very, a different thing with Twitter. People that have something to say to the world twice a day, <laughs> I envy that. I know. I, I can't tweet because with every tweet that I would write, I would think, does the world need to know this? And is this news to the world? Or is, this, has, is there an entertainment value? What is valuable about this thing that I'm going to throw out into the world? And the answer is always nothing. And that's why I don't tweet, you know. Um, and, and, and with movies, it's kind of the same now that there's so much and that you just pull up Netflix and there are a couple, they add, what, 700 shows a year or something crazy, you know, that at some point you go like, does the world need my contribution to that? If I weren't me and I didn't want to be a director, would I say it's a life spent well contributing the 701st show episode of that show to Netflix to, to throw into this huge ocean of stuff that already exists? Do I just, you know, throw away my life out of, out of I, I don't know what it is, because that creative bug has got me. But overall, if I think about what you could do with your life and how you could do something valuable, is this the right way to do it? And am I 
interesting enough, do I have enough interesting things to say to the world to justify spending my life that way? And the answer to that being no is probably what scares me the most in terms of creative, the, my creative life. Otherwise, mimes and clowns are definitely out there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I find that interesting too about the Twitter analogy because I've seen people who, seen ladies tweet about, hey, I just finished my gynecology appointment and you're like, you know, I don't really need to know that. But I, I think that people have a point to everything they tweet and again, it's the same with storytelling. So there's some either thing that they want to get out there, agenda, message, whatever, or just a cool story to be told. And I think it's the same with Twitter. There, there's some type of an agenda to what the tweet is, even if it's, hey guys, this is great coffee at this place or, you know, whatever. Right. But um, maybe it goes back to the filter of seeing what your message or your story is and how you view it. Because some people think that everything they do needs to be broadcasts and others Oh, that makes, are more hesitant. That makes a lot of sense. That that maybe goes back to that I simulate the audience in my head too much from from directing and from storytelling. I do the same with my tweets. That I go like, what it, who it, would my audience be, and how would they process this, and how would it be interesting to them? Which maybe a lot of people that tweet don't do because they're not as obsessed with the audience reaction. But it's more like to put it out into the world, and that's it, and that's fine. Which is a beautiful mindset. Maybe I should try to get back to that, to not overthink it, but just to kind of pump something out into the world and be happy about it. What a beautiful mindset to think that the world is interested whether you just had a gynecology <laughs> appointment or not, you know, great. Yeah. But hard Pass to get yourself. Flying colors. Yeah. 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 Everything looks good. Right. Okay. Thanks. Are you where you planned to be right now for filmmaking with your career? Am I where I plan to be? I think I always, in, in my younger years, always saw myself as a writer-director because that to me was like the, the total creator, whereas the director is just the translator of someone else's inspiration. Um, so no, I'm not, I'm not where I saw myself or wished myself or am even wishing myself right now. It's just that writing is so hard and I have such respect for writers that do that to themselves and the, the stakes of that, of, of you working on something for years that then might or might not get made or might or might not even turn out well um, is kind of more than I can, I can bear with my fragile creative ego. So I'm kind of playing it safe by staying in the, in the directing world, which I probably should. Thinking about it now, I probably should write again and, and try, try more of that. Because I think that the fulfillment that you get from seeing your story, not just the way it's told on screen, but your story from, from the first seed is something that might, must be spectacular, that I've only had with my very first movie ever, um, where I hadn't even written the script, but it was a found footage thing that just came to be. Um, but to know that these characters would not exist without me having had the idea for them was incredible. And I haven't had that since, because these characters that I now bring to life, they are already jumping off the page and just putting them on the screen, so they would exist in some other incarnation one way or the other. So again, it goes back to for me being that the writer being the real creative driving force behind any storytelling. And then the format is just what the director is involved with. I think um, it's also the turbulence that goes along with writing. I mean, I was watching a documentary that compared um, Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler and their lives. Uh -huh. And their lives had been, you know, turbulent for different reasons, but it, it was very, um, maybe the turbulence of the writing contributed to the, the depth of the stories. Right. You know, and uh, with directing, some of that, you, you're, like you said, you're taking other people's, maybe even turbulence, and you're bringing it to life, but you don't have to necessarily experience all that. I, I yeah, and the risk, you don't take the risk of just wasting a lot of time. You know, if I, if I get sent a script and it's financed, then I know the time that I spend on it right now will translate into, most of the time, will translate into a finished product on screen. Whereas if I sit down at the computer with a blank page and I start you know, writing scene one, day, so and so, the chances of that actually ending up on screen one day are so minuscule, so minuscule, um, which I think you just have to be either ignorant of to do it or be completely delusional to do it anyway. At, great, you know, more power to the people that can do that. 
I get demotivated, I think, too quickly. If I hear the numbers, some producers said to me that in their company, which produced a lot back then, they have about 8% of what makes it into the final stages of development, that they are really developing with a full intention of making it to the screen. 8% of that makes it to the screen. And only a, a minuscule percentage of what they start developing makes it into the final stages. So really someone, and I don't want to demotivate anyone, I think any writer has to be so driven anyway that the numbers don't matter and they just write it because they have to write it because otherwise it'll tear them apart. But if you did look at the numbers, I think you would, you would try to do something other than start writing a script from scratch. And I know that's exactly where I'm going wrong and I should find the courage again to just do it for the creative outlet and I just haven't in a couple of years. So that's the answer to do I find myself where I wanted to be? No. But I also have to earn a living which would be really hard if I now took a year or two to write a script that then might or might not ever get me. You know, so like real life just kind of kicks in at some point. Right, right. And if you look at a lot of the writers that continually put their work out there and the turbulence that went through it, you know, maybe it's, it's just being more of a realist. Yeah. Or pra pragmatic or, you know, just. I wonder if realism and pragmatism is like the big enemy of the creative spark that you almost have to fight that as much as you can or look it straight in the eye and say, I know that I might live under a bridge in a year because I can't pay my rent, but it doesn't matter because I'd rather live under a bridge and do creatively what I was born to do than live in a cozy apartment and be miserable because I'm not doing that. I think it's either of those, of those two things. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if uh, speaking of another like LA-based writer, um, I know uh, Dashiell Hammett was in the Bay Area, but um, you know Charles Bukowski, you know, just yes, you know, brilliant person, but the turbulence that came out of that, and and what comes first, um, the turbulent sort of mind uh, with amazing ideas and stories, or or the process of doing something over and over again and being rejected and then that brings out the turbulence. I don't know, right. like chicken or the egg type thing. But that's also part of the pragmatism we're talking about then. I'm, I know, I'm self-aware enough to know that I'm not a Bukowski, that I'm not a, a genius with a turbulent story that, you know, I'm probably a pretty, if you look at it, a pretty mediocre writer. So factoring that into my chances of success, if I knew I were a genius writer, I would take that chance. But knowing that I'm, I'm, I have friends that are so much better writers that don't get anywhere and really should, that it would take a lot of ego for me to suddenly say, you know what, I have to say something to the world that trumps all that and is going to surpass all that. Okay. I wish I could tell you something more inspirational than I'm too afraid to write. But at the moment, that's kind of the, the reason why I just direct. So maybe the inspirational thing would be if you, if you still have that energy in you and that fight to, to make your story heard amazing and go for it, I would say. Well, I think even with uh, Raymond Chandler, wasn't he fired from his oil job? So it kind of, he was in a spot where he was ready to do it. So again, it was right. sort of like, you know, life sort of kind of stripped everything away. But right. Yeah. I, I, would imagine that's the case for many people and that's why you see people with these dual careers you know and that the cre creative path presents itself when the pragmatic real life path comes to a difficult spot kind of a thing sure. yeah uh -huh. you know and, and comparing those two men's lives i think raymond chandler came from more impoverished means and he actually became you know he ended up living in la jolla you know he sort of like wrote with sort of he was sort of the enemy of the 1% sort of in his writing, you know, and here he almost kind of became it. It's just so right. very interesting. Right. And, uh, and unfortunately, Dashiell Hammett was, I guess, um, taken out by, uh, you know, the, the Marx, you know, um, the Red Scare and was blacklisted. Right. And, uh, do you ever think that we'll see anything like that in our, our time again? You know, how it's so artists... It's so unimaginable that we'll go through another full-blown McCarthy area, era. Um, but then everything might be leading up to it because a lot of the things about going political, but a lot of the things that are happening right now, I never would have thought we will ever see again in, in the US, just as in Germany or other parts of Europe that should really know better, especially Germany. There's no excuse with that history um, for any move to the right. And it's, it's crazy. 
So I guess anything is possible and, and to become politically more interested. I was completely disinterested in politics, I have to admit, um, before the Trump era, because it always felt everything is kind of going into a borderline reasonable direction. And the minutia of it all seemed very boring, very, you know, um, that definitely has changed, <laughs> you know, um, because it's a, it's a daily soap opera now that is actually thrilling um, to watch, but it's also, <laughs> It's, it's also unimaginable that we are that we are watching that. So I think you have a good point that it's totally possible that that will happen again. And maybe not with exactly the same methods, maybe a little bit more subtle so that you don't hit those buttons where we are now more aware of censorship and of blacklisting and all that kind of stuff. But we are also more aware of fascism and there are still signs of that ra raising its head again. So I don't know, but let's keep an eye out. Same. Yeah, you know, there's a quote, and forgive me, I don't know who it's from, but it, it says something like, beware of artists, they can move between groups, like they're the most dangerous. And I, I'm butchering the quote, but I found that very interesting that artists would be uh, scary for, I guess, just because of what they create and, and the effect on the masses. Right. And they just said how they can move between sort of classes and groups easily and that that is actually the most sort of terrifying. I don't know, I'm yeah. butchering it. Yeah. It's interesting because I was, the first thought that I had when the, this political change happened that now happened was that I felt really bad for the arts because in my mind, storytelling was always this tradition that bundles our values and our experiences and everything we have to pass on to the next generation in terms of what's in terms of what's right and what's decent and what's important. Um, and we put that into a story and then we pass it on. And that's been going on for centuries and centuries, you know, with films for a hundred years. And yet what happened, happened, which basically politically um, people are getting to power that are defying every value that we've been passing on in terms of decency, in terms of blah, blah, blah. Um, so does that mean that storytelling is actually far less powerful than I always thought? Because if stories had millennia to inst in instill some kind of basic level of, of compassion and decency and all that in us, which is what almost every, almost every story is, is talking about. Now it's talking about values of, of freedom and tolerance and all these things. There are very few stories that talk positively about fascism or about, you know, screwing over the weakest part of society and all that. So how is it possible that someone can come in, not just Trump, all over the world, which makes it even scarier, wipe all that away, every the Disney movie we've been showing our children to kind of get them to be good people, um, and within a couple of months um, dismantle that whole thing? Like what does, what does that say about the power of story? I don't know what the answer to that is, but it's, I have less faith in storytelling than I used to before this era, for sure. And I hope that that'll change. And, and hopefully storytelling can contribute to some kind of age of reason being ushered back in. Um, I don't know. How do you create a horror protagonist? How do you create a horror protagonist? Again, I would say, the same way you create any other protagonist, which means your goal is to have the audience build a relationship with that person that they are not ambivalent about him or her. They can hate her or love him or whatever, but there has to be some kind of emotional connection because otherwise none of the horror set pieces that follow will mean anything because it happens to a person we don't care about. So we need, the audience needs to care, you know. Um, and then the question is, how do you achieve that? There is the whole save the cat kind of concept that you have to have that one moment where the protagonist displays some kind of humanity where I see myself, I recognize myself in that person, or I, you know, I, I kind of want that person to be okay and like that person. Um, there's humor, which is a great weapon, I think, to make the audience kind of identify with a person, but it's hard and it's very rarely done. Like if I have to, 
if I'd have to tell you horror protagonists right now where that is the case, I'd have difficulties with that. You know? And then you see scripts, I just read a script by a friend of mine for a, for a pilot where she achieves that in the first two pages. Which in, in that case was very simple if you look at it, if someone has done it and done it well, it's so, it's so simple. It's basically a girl in a college environment who is doing and an, has big stage fright and is going to their talent show, their open mic thing, to do a political art thing. And you love her so much, I think, because you can identify with that fear to go up in front of everybody, but she does it anyway because of her conviction, because she cares so much and she cares about bees in that case. She's, the torment of the bees is something that she just has to tell her to the world because she can't bear how bees are treated. So that combination of someone will look social death straight in the eye to save bees. I was like, that girl I'm on board with as a protagonist, even if she on page three starts killing people, <laughs> I would still go like, you go girl. You know? um, and that's a huge, huge goal. And that's, I think, not at all uh, genre dependent. That's a very interesting question. If, if you ask our other horror filmmakers, if they have uh, an angle on how they establish their protagonists that is influenced by the fact that they're working in horror. I know that that's not the case for me, for sure. I think with Jamie Lee Curtis's character, it seemed like she was pretty much well liked through, through, you know, in, in Halloween. That's true. She definitely yeah. was the darling. Um, That'd be interesting to dissect why that was the case. Like, why do people gravitate to some characters? Because I, there, I couldn't tell you a kind of save the cat moment, for example, when she was established necessarily. Right. Like, wh which are other horror protagonists that you? feel strongly about? Do they have a strong sympathy for? Well, Carrie, I always felt. Carrie. But I don't think, I think Carrie was more polarizing because people thought she was creepy, so she, quote, deserved it. And I think, unfortunately, that's a mob mentality. But that is okay, too, because it's an emotion and an investment that, that half of the audience hates Carrie and the other half loves Carrie. That is goal achieved. You know, you don't need 100% for the audience to love her. You just want to keep the number of people that are indifferent towards your protagonist as low as possible, you know? Um, and Carrie is a great example where I think that was very, very successfully done, for sure. Yeah. Right, right. And um, Linda Blair, I think she was more, more liked, you know, she was sort of, she wasn't her fault that she was possessed. Right. But then Linda Blair in The Exorcist is, is like a type. If, if you had to tell me what that girl was really like. I don't think it's a very interesting personality where you go like, oh, she came so to life as a human being that I can't get her out of my head. Like you could have, the, the, the stuff that happened to her was so horrendous that if you had that happen to any child, it would probably have that effect, you know? So I don't even know if the, or if even The Shining, if I go through there, there are not many, there are not many movies that successfully do that, period. But I think there are probably even less in, in horror. And if I had to speculate, I would say that has to do with an, a, a misguided focus on horror set pieces. That we think a good horror movie is made of great horror set pieces, which is true. Um, but that the character development is overlooked in that case. If I, if I um, look at The Sixth Sense, for example, that boy and his torment to me worked so well. If, that, if there had been no ghosts and it was just about that boy, I would still care about that boy because he was, he, he, it was so well acted, it was so well directed, it was so well written that I cared by the time that the scary stuff started happening. Or just to stick with Shyamalan, un, Unbreakable, I know has this one moment in the very beginning where the boy who is yearning to spend time with his father um, the father is calling him and he's on a playground playing soccer with his friends and he goes like, guys, guys, I gotta go, I have to hang out with my father. And then he turns around again and goes, I'm gonna spend time with my dad. It was so, I could cry right now, it was so heartbreaking, it was so beautiful. And just from those two lines, I care, you know? And was that even the question? What was the question? Oh, the, well, how do you make a great horror protagonist? Right, mm -hmm. yes. Um, yeah, just make me, 
ideally make me fall in love with a character. And I think that's much like in real life. Sometimes one moment makes you fall in love with someone and go like, I care about that person because I've seen a vulnerability or whatever it is that that moment did. If you can create that with your protagonist, that's a huge achievement that will pay off hugely throughout your movie. Right, and even when they have ugly moments, because everybody does, you could see someone in one moment and they're having the worst day possible and then you're going to brand that person as a horrible human being every time you see them because that was your first. Right. But with the movie, yeah, we get a chance to see a better build up. Yeah. You see that in documentaries about serial killers. They always show that picture of the serial killer as a child. Right. Done. You know, because you're like, no, that's the starting point, that innocence, and then something happened to them that made them into this monster. But it's such a it's such an easy trick to just do that, but it works for everybody because it's this cute child that deserved better than to be turned into a serial killer. Yeah. Right. That's a great analogy. It's yeah. The same mechanism, I think. Yeah. Right, right. And so then yeah, you see that that photo and then you hear sort of, you know, the hard life or whatever that went with it. And so then you soften toward the person. Everything that happens after that you link back to that. Yeah. Even though they had like seven bodies buried in the backyard, but they, you saw, yeah, you see the little child and then you yeah. think, how could they? Yeah, Eileen Warners, I think the great documentary yes. on making of a serial killer. I was just thinking about her. I was thinking when you wow. talked about it, I was like, she's talking about Eileen Warnos. Because they did that, they had this great picture of her. And then they, that came along with, she had to sleep out in the car in the snow and people brought, it doesn't matter what she does after that. You know, she killed seven people. I don't care, I'm with her, you know, it's, it's her tragedy that I'm watching from then on out. And it's really just, it takes less than 20 seconds to do it. And it's such a big payoff. And that's why it's so crazy to me that most movies that I watch do either not invest those 20 seconds or haven't found a good way to make me care about the protagonist before they take me on this journey. Or Ted Bundy, who was charming, incredibly bright, had a high emotional IQ. Didn't he act as his own attorney in court? Yes. I mean, he just, so it's, he's more forgivable somehow. Is that, is that it? I don't know. To me, Bundy is because of those things more fascinating, but it doesn't make him any less of a monster. The part that when, when I read about it was that he worked on a, for a suicide hotline and saved people's lives. And then he turned to a serial killer. So that part, Suicide hotline where he genuinely saved people's lives on the phone. Wow. Now I care. All the other stuff that he was brilliant and he represented himself in court, that is all still psychopath stuff. That is interesting. It makes him such, a, such an evergreen as a serial killer. I could watch Bundy stuff day and night. I'm obsessed with that man. But I still wouldn't care for him as much as I care for Eileen Warnos after that childhood picture if I hadn't heard that piece about the, the suicide hotline. You know? Whereas John Wayne Gacy, maybe, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, the whole, the, 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 the physical, I, I hate to go there, but are we blinded by that in terms of our, our, our protagonists and antagonists and the whole clown thing? And it was, cre you know, whereas Bundy, you probably, you put a modern day one, many women would have fallen for right. it. It'd be very easy. Right. And, and then maybe that's what makes it even more terrifying. You see someone a certain way and you think, okay, yeah, that could be that quote serial killer composite. Right. But someone like, no, could never, no way. Well, it's always so crazy to me that when, when you hear people t tell their stories, you are on their side with all crime shows I always have. There's this meek person, let's say BTK, the BTK killer, this meek person in court that says, yes, sir, Sorry, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And you can't help but liking him. And you know that he has like hung children from the ceiling and let them suffocate and then, you know, crazy stuff. But you can't bring those two things together. I had that with a friend of mine got murdered in Germany in, in, oh. in film school. And I went to the trial and saw the person that shot him. And I could not bring myself to hate that guy, even though I should have because he was telling his story from his point of view, you know, and I just couldn't put those two things together. Um, and I think that is maybe a lesson in storytelling, that it's all about point of view and about the angle and what you spend time on. Obviously, in that case, they suddenly spend a lot of time on his childhood, 
where before that I was only spending time, my, my energy on the moment of my friend getting murdered. But it depends on where you start that story and how much emphasis you put on stuff and maybe got to bring that back to horror movies. A lot of horror movies seem to not look, not spend a lot of time on that character development, but rush to the first set piece as quickly as possible. And you always have the opening sequence where this family with the boxes are standing in front of the old spooky house that they just inherited <laughs> or whatever. We go like, really? Yeah. Um, but I think they would, be, they would be better served spending more time on that initial, which again, doesn't have to be much time even, but to, to hammer home that moment that I can put my finger on in the script and go like, this is the moment that is going to make my audience fall in love with my protagonist. That should almost be a requirement for every scene show me that moment um, and you almost shouldn't read on if you can't put your finger on that moment because you know that something is wrong with, with that script. That sounds harsh but I think we would get much better movies if that were a requirement for the writer to point out the, the point where he or she thinks the audience will fall in love with the protagonist or hate the protagonist or develop some emotional attachment um, to the protagonist. I'm definitely glad that I was allowed to grow up before Instagram because if I look, we just had an au pair, a 19 year old from Germany and it was amazing to see her live just for a couple of weeks because so much energy and thought is put into the side job that you have 24 seven of being a PR agent for yourself because you owe it, you have to present yourself to your peers through Instagram. I don't think that not having an Instagram account is an option even. You'd be an outcast and a crazy person immediately. And that means you have to not only update your own account, but you also have to make sure to like your friends' things quickly and because it says something about your friendship, blah, 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 blah. And they have totally internalized that and they are great at it, but it must be so stressful. If I imagine I had had my normal childhood and gone to school and all that, and then I also have to moonlight as a PR expert, I would have gone nuts. So I could imagine that that contributes to the, the, the nervous energy out there of, of creating spectacles that will bring people's attention to what you're doing. And if you can't do that in a positive way, do it in a negative way. Um, that's, that's scary. Yeah, I'm glad Instagram wasn't around when I was right? a teenager too. Yeah, just the pressure of it. Mm. And if everybody feels pressure, whether they're the most popular to the most uh, outcast yeah. of, of sort of the school or whatever. And, and you have to interpret everything. Why did my friend not like my photograph? So and so, are we not? Like the, the value of the friendships, there seems to be like a stock market, market of value of friendships all the time that rise and fall by likes collected. But to even survey that is a full time job, you know? So it's just so much time and energy and thought process being put into that. And I don't know how much positive comes out of that. I can see a lot of positive uh, things with social media, with the internet, obviously. I wouldn't want to live in times before the internet. But I don't know how much positive things come out of this, this, this self-presentational kind of Instagram thing. But I'm also too old, obviously, to to really appreciate it, I guess. Yeah, but maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm at peace with that. I mean, we, we put our stuff on Instagram, but it's not really lifestyle related. Right, you know, it's so also not you as a person. Right, right, right yeah. which, is, which is wonderful. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at this stage of your career, how do you measure your own success? How do I measure my own success? I have to admit, we just talked about social media. Um, that what is fun is that you have a direct feedback loop from your audience audience on Twitter. So I do read Twitter um, and their comments because the great thing is that, that people that are posting on Twitter don't think that you are reading it. So it's really, it's the purest feedback you can get more than I get from my family or from my agents or from anyone ever. The most honest opinion um, is Twitter and what is great about it too, which you always forget is kind of the innocence and the, the lack of cynicism with which a general audience outside of Hollywood consumes your stuff. 
because you are in, in this bubble of other storytellers and filmmakers and, and, and you spend your life in that and you develop your stuff in that and they test view it. You're always in this mindset of what is new, what is cutting edge, what is unpredictable, blah, 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 all that stuff. And then you put it out there and you realize that the, the, the scene that you thought was the most generic and you were slightly embarrassed by, people get so excited about. And we, in, I did an episode of Fear the Walking Dead and there was someone's head getting chopped off, some zombie's head getting chopped off. And that is suddenly the most exciting moment for everybody. And it, it, it reminds me of this pure joy of, of consuming cinema that I, th I think I threw out the window and sacrificed when I went to film school because that was taken from me, the actual watching a movie as a movie and enjoying it as a movie and not always thinking, am I cool and intellectual in liking this or not liking this? You either liked something or you didn't like something. Um, so that's always a real interesting thing to kind of get that reaction. So a lot of how I judge my success is how thrilled or enthusiastic are people on Twitter as individuals. I don't even know if there are 10 people of them out there or a thousand people. It almost doesn't matter because it's, it's, it goes back to why you originally wanted to tell stories to evoke a genuine emotion in someone. If it's just that one person that says my favorite movie is and then it's my movie, which seems to happen with, I, I did that as a test to just type in some random indie movie that I didn't make to just see if it's somebody's favorite movie. And it is. You almost can't put a movie title into Twitter that someone has not said it's their new favorite movie. And that's the most beautiful thing in the world to think that I, not because I'm special or a great filmmaker, but just by the virtue of having made a movie, I created someone's favorite movie. That's almost enough of a success to, to justify wanting to make movies all over again. Do you respond, you said? You, do you do respond? No. Oh, you don't? Okay. No. I've done that in the, in the, at the very beginning because I thought, oh, how cool would it have been when I was young um, that the filmmaker actually responds. Yeah, that would have blown my mind. So I did that in the beginning, but it never ends well because you can't live, live up to that because, I, which I totally understand, that for an audience it's hard to have that contact and then not have that contact anymore. So then you're getting, Chris, in that case, Chris, I'm still getting Christmas emails from <laughs> someone I was in touch with 2010. In the first years I still wrote back, but then how do you, you know? So, the, and especially with negative stuff, like never, it's always a mistake to respond in any way to negative stuff because you can't, you can't win, you know, other than you can, maybe you could, if you wanted to respond, you could respond positively and say, good point, I see your criticism. Um, but to defend yourself is always a mistake. And we were, in film school, we were prepped really well for that because we made our short films and then we presented them to the class and we had to sit in front of the screen and kind of look at the look at your class and you weren't allowed to respond they would throw all their criticism at you and your only exercise was to say thank you for the for the criticism blah, blah, blah. not justify anything not say anything that was the greatest prep in the world because in real life you also don't get to i mean on twitter you might if you wanted to you could reply to two or three people but there are tens of thousands of other people whom you don't get to respond to. Like your thing that you made and put out there and ask them to donate two years of, two, two hours of their lifetime to has to speak for itself. You don't get any director's commentary on that stuff or any you know, Q&A afterwards where you get to justify stuff. Um, so you better make sure that you say everything that you needed to say in the main piece. That's why, again, why test screenings to me among friends or among a small group of people are so important because there you still get to react. But once you shoot it out into the world, that's it. You're done. And it's really hard. It's really hard to have people, for example, misunderstand stuff and say stuff about your movie where you're like, you misunderstand the entire, and some of them love the movie, but understand it completely wrong. And you want to say like, no, that's not at all. It's, but you don't get to it. That's, that's kind of their privilege. To, you had the privilege that they listened to you for two hours and now it's their privilege, privilege that for the rest of your life they're allowed to say whatever they want about your movie and you have to take it. Whether you listen to it or not is a different thing, but you don't get to reply. That seems fair to me in the end. Is that common to have a class in film school where you're sort of 
allowed to be, like the peanut gallery, so to speak, is allowed to kind of throw food at you a little bit? At, at the film school I went to, it was. That's very progressive. From, from the very, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe. This is in Germany? No, it was here. Here, oh, here okay. LA, yeah, yeah. Um, and it was good that we weren't allowed. I remember that one, in the, in the beginning, maybe there were classes where we were still allowed to answer. And one of my fellow directors, sweetest guy, super talented, said the film that end, the, the, the sentence that ended his film school career. Um, and he said to someone saying something, oh, that's what I was going for, that's what I was wanting to do, uh, but I didn't think that my cinematographer and my editor were capable of it. <laughs> and you just could feel the silence. And for the next two and a half years, nobody wanted to, oh. to work with him. And I know that's not how he meant it. Right, he right. meant it in terms of that it could be done in the time frame that the school gives us, sure. with the equipment that this... But there he didn't get a second shot at it. He was like, he had the, from then on out, the, were the least talented cinematographers, the ones that no one else wanted to team up with. Blah, 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 blah. It echoed through. So I was always kind of glad that the mandate for the other lesson was you don't get to respond because then you can put, can't put your foot in your mouth at least. Where would you like to go next? Where would I got, like to go next? Um, I definitely would like to make another feature, but I also want to do TV. I think we live in times now where filmmakers have to do both. Um, two completely different worlds, but I would love to do um, both. And just the same as always, I just want to find a great script where I have the feeling I haven't read the story before and there's just a copy of something that I've already uh, read, which is hard because obviously there are bigger and better filmmakers than me that get those scripts first. So my approach has to be a little bit of a different one. If I just wait and sit, sit and wait, um, that might never happen. So I kind of have to team up with writers to develop it and bring, bring the first ideas uh, out there so that it is actually mine and I can direct it rather than other people. Um, I probably have to be more proactive in that than I've used to be in the past. But that's where I want to go next. Yeah. When you say proactive, uh, what does that entail? Because, you know, you think about having to push a career forward in Hollywood and you kind of think of like this, this pushy agenda and if that's not in you as a person, because it's kind of like a used car salesman feeling to it, how do you, how do you be proactive when that goes against your nature? Well, I would say proactive first on the creative level. That doesn't yet mean to talk to any producers or any buyers or any whatever, whatever, because true, I, I wouldn't know how to do that and that there are people for that too. Um, but it's obviously a different mindset if I just say I am the director for hire and I'm waiting for my agent to send me a script, you know, that there is a script that I read and say this is great that I then get to direct, the chances are pretty slim. Whereas if I have an idea that I like and I team up with a writer and say, do you like this idea? Should we develop this together? And we even get it into treatment form. It doesn't even have to be a script if we just write five pages of it, then we can take that out and talk to people and say, here's the idea, which again should speak for itself. I shouldn't have to be a used car salesman that does a great presenting job, you know, um, but ideally the idea is kind of captivating um, enough. And then hopefully things would develop from there that the, the company that we've pitched it to are paying for a first draft and things are going on their way and the great thing is that I'm from the very beginning attached as a director. I don't have to go to the job interview and tell them my vision of whatever to win it over other directors that are doing the same, but I am as one of the creators, um, I'm on board from the very beginning. I think that's how that would have to be done for someone in my position who is not a huge name in directing. Spielberg obviously doesn't have to do that because he gets the good project. Um, sent, but I have to kind of create a little bit more. So I think that's the, the proactive thing. It's just to create ideas myself more than I have in the past. Because in the past, the, the credo was let's only do greenlit projects, meaning projects that are already being financed and are ready to go. Because developing takes so long that you spend years of not getting paid for then the project to maybe fall apart, which is a, a risk. That's why in the past I always was hired for greenlit projects that then went, um, but you only get a certain quality of material like that, you know. Um, so to, to generate the idea yourself has these two, I think, these 
two advantages. One is you already like the seed of it all, which is huge, which is hard to find if you are snobby about it. Uh, and you are already attached as the creative force behind it. So those are two great, great starting points. Do you really think there are uh, stories that have not been done before? Of course, that it goes back to every story has been told, but not every story has been told in new and original enough ways that make me either not recognize it as a story that has already been told, or that makes me forget that it's a story that has been told. So maybe it's just a, a, a rephrasing of the telling a new story. Maybe you're not telling a new story, um, but you are it's like cooking, right? It's like you, you might not have a completely new, you might not suddenly eat things that have never been eaten before. I don't suddenly eat, make a dinner out of plastic and metal and wood. I'm still using vegetables and whatever. Um, but the recipe might be a completely new one. And when people eat it, it's an experience that they haven't had that way. That's basically all I'm looking for. Whereas a lot of scripts that you get are experiences that you've already had better and stronger and it's a weaker copy of that and that's kind of what you want to avoid right what are your thoughts of making a living as a film director in 2019 is it possible is it doable is it more so with television my thoughts on making a living as a filmmaker in 2019 it's definitely possible because people are people are doing it um, I think it's a great time, especially for female filmmakers, um, which you can't point out uh, enough that if I've seen my, my director, female director friends over the past years that have always bumped up against some wall of subtle sexism that was just only so far they went. They were smarter than us male filmmakers and they were more committed and yet if you saw the numbers they just didn't get to direct the projects they should have. And I think that is very much over right now. All my female directing filmmakers, they are having stellar careers. One of them just had a commercial during the Super Bowl. You know, it's like out of, and, and fast, out of short films one day and heading TV shows the next day. So for female filmmakers, I don't know if I've, I've been alive during a better um, period. That comes with its, its deserved counterpart, that it's slightly harder for me, that I'm not a female filmmaker right now, to find TV projects, because it's just the time, luckily, it's taken long enough off the female um, filmmaker. No show can afford this, this atrocity that, they, that happened before, where it was like a, a 12 episodes made by 12 white male filmmakers. You know? When that was still the case, it was easy for me to find a job, but luckily we're more woke now, you know. So um, I, I kind of see it, get a little bit of the taste of what that must have been like, where it's just hard to get that job, what it must have been like for them for you know, years and years and years and years. And I've only done it for a year or, or, or two since that kind of the whole Harvey Weinstein thing kind of happened. And a lot of good stuff came out of, out of that, you know, in terms of society uh, changes. But yeah, I would say for female filmmakers, this is, this is the time and I hope that it's not just a fashion that will reverse itself quickly, but that we really have um, started a new era, which also comes just with different stories being told differently. Like, I, I don't know if that's politically correct to say, but I have the feeling that movies, projects that are directed by female directors, oftentimes they have a different feel to what their male counterpart would have done with it. And I think that's such a treasure for society to be exposed to both rather than just to the, the male perspective that we've been living with for 400 years. How does a director break into television? How does a director break into television? I think that is a very good question that I don't have an answer for um, because it's that catch-22 that you sometimes bump up against that you have, have to have done. They want you to have done it before, but obviously there has to be the point where you do it for the first time time, right? You have to break into it somehow. I was lucky in that my first uh, episodes that I ever got were for BBC America. Um, there, were, there was a group of incredibly smart and inspirational uh, women at the helm and they wanted 
uh, feature filmmakers. To them, it was an asset that I hadn't done TV anymore uh, before. Uh, but that's probably a very forward thinking, uh, courageous thing that you don't necessarily find everywhere. Most, most uh, channels want people that have done TV before. And same for pilot directing. Um, you are either a pilot director, meaning you have directed a pilot again which, before, which makes you eligible for being hired to direct another pilot, or you're not. I'm not a pilot director because I haven't done a pilot before, so I don't get to direct pilots. It's a mystery to me how I'm supposed to become a pilot director. So I totally understand if other filmmakers to them it's a mystery how to break into TV. I have no idea. A, a miracle has to happen. <laughs> what was the BBC project? It was called Intruders. What was, was it about? Um, it was about reincarnation. It was Glenn Morgan, the showrunner of X-Files, was the showrunner. It had Mira Sovino in it, um, James Frain, and, oh, most importantly, Millie Brown, who then rose to stardom in Stranger Things ah, as okay. the, main, the main girl, right, right. Uh, mm -hmm. who is absolutely incredible. Um, it was based on a British book, very good book, um, but for some reason it didn't really catch on and was cancelled after one season. But to me it was great because I got to make four episodes. It was eight episodes altogether. It was Eduardo Sanchez of the Blair Witch Project who did the first four and I did the last four. So that was kind of great to really get the hang of the TV style which is so different from movies. You know, to be able to practice that over four episodes. I was really lucky there. And it was shot in the UK? In uh, Vancouver. Ah, okay, interesting. What do you see as the difference between British television, and not comedies, of course, there's definitely a difference in humor, but uh, something that's supernatural or horror-based versus uh, American, or maybe there's no difference. I enjoyed the BBC's, uh, yeah. I mean, everything they do, it's excellent documentaries. Yeah, I mean, if you watch Killing Eve, which is my favorite show at the moment, which is incredible, I think that illustrates that, that point that character is everything more than anything else and I think the Brits really have that down they don't their actors are not the most modelly looking people there are people that we believe as real people and they are not worried to let them have negative sides to them so they're very relatable and much more interesting um, to watch and then British actors I think also approach the craft differently than than American actors um, so it's a different, it's a different vibe. So I love the British, not just for what, what they do is that they only do a couple of episodes, they do it brilliantly and then they're out of there. It's kind of the opposite of the American way where it's like we have something that we will beat to death over eight seasons now. <laughs> if you look at the office I mean, the original office, which was a complete genius has what 10, 10 episodes or something like that's, that's it. And, it will, and they quit on the height of their success, Ricky Gervais was like, done with that, I've given this everything that I had in me, boom. I don't know how they, where they get that integrity, because the money aspect is still there, obviously. But then the US remade it into what, which was also a great show, but into eight, ten seasons of The Office, you know. Um, same with Fleabag, or with all these great shows, they just don't overdo it. And that's why every, as an audience member, I feel my time is really appreciated because they put all their ideas and all their jokes and everything that is, makes it brilliant into a shorter amount of time because I have less episodes. It's more bundled and I don't feel like it's dragged out. Whereas with a lot of the American shows, I have, and I don't want to poo poo on American shows. No, more, no, right. other, mm -hmm. um, but you have the feeling there's, there are one or two ideas in there and the rest is stretched out. You know, so here's the plot point for this episode. And the rest is, they would call it character development, but oftentimes it's just wasting your time somehow. Whereas the British stuff is like, here are eight plot developments or character developments in 45 minutes. So it's just a, a much more, I don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a in, in more interesting format to me. You had said with the uh, British actors, maybe their approach to the characters might be slightly different than American. Do you think they get more theater training? Do yeah. you think it's used to being in front of a live audience and it's, there's a different presence? Yeah, very much. I think it's also that I think method acting is very much an American thing. Whereas what someone said, and I don't know how true that is or not, is that the American way of acting is from the inside out, from the emotion out. 
and the British acting is from the outside in. Which is interesting because the American acting, if you just describe it like that, sounds like it's more, has more integrity than kind of pretending a physical presence and then have that inform the character. But I think that's what a lot of the British actors do, that they figure out the physicality of something and then let that inform how they feel about it, whereas the American way is the other way around. And as a director, what's interesting, first of all, every British actor I've ever worked with, and I don't want to generalize, but they've been great to work with, the most modest, focused, humble people ever. And I think that's partly the theater education, but also that the star system over there is a different one. Like they see themselves as actors, not as celebrities or personalities. Or blah, 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 blah. And then because you are, you are kind of working with them on something that comes from the outside in, they are much less sensitive to adjustments, sometimes with American actors, because you're basically, your, your workshop is their psyche and their emotions and all that from, it's a very sensitive subject matter because if you, if, you, if you give them an adjustment that basically means that you ask them to feel differently about something, right? And why they feel about something a certain way is their entire programming, their entire DNA, their entire life so far. So you giving them an adjustment goes right into all that. So it's very, very deep. Whereas with the British way of acting, that ego isn't attached to that. It was just kind of one thing they tried out this way. If you want an adjustment, they'll try something else. And then they will tell you how that makes them feel. And then you can work from there. So it's weird that, that if I hear myself talk about it, it seems like the more superficial way of working. And yet the effects are, are very, very strong and very, very fun. I don't know why that is. That's a really interesting observation. Huh. I think I have a follow-up for that. That's really fascinating. I wouldn't... Yeah. You would think it would be different because it is internal. Going, It's the reverse and, and how that actually may work. That the internal one is, is the higher art of acting than the other one, right? But it's in, in practice, it's not with the results that you get. Yeah. Maybe that's also that I'm just totally making stuff up. I know very little about the acting experience. But that, that there must be a lot of energy that is being lost on creating that emotion that then we don't necessarily see. Whereas with the British way of acting, all the energy, because it's from the outside in, is something we, we see. There's not as much energy lost in the underbelly of invisibility, you know? whereas you get the results immediately. Um, and I don't want to speak against method acting. I think it's, it's wonderful, but it's a different, sure. it's definitely a different experience. Yeah. What are the advantages and disadvantages of being a studio director for hire? Advantages and disadvantages of being a director for hire. The big advantage is that you get a paycheck and you get residuals and you can live uh, uh, on that and be a filmmaker full time, which is huge. And there's nothing, nothing negative about that. Um, the negatives are that you have very little influence um, in, especially with TV, in the, the creative development process because you are the director. You're not seen as the filmmaker necessarily, but you're hired to do the focused task of directing and the development has been done by the writers and by the showrunners. And by the bum, 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 bum. Um, and then you, you, it's a total lottery if you run into great executives that are super smart. And, and I've had that where I constantly think, wow, I haven't thought about it that way. That's amazing, where they're a real asset to the project. Or if you run into people that must be friends of a friend of someone that hired them, have no idea about story structure, no real interest in story structure, but sometimes just like to hear themselves talk or have to give notes because that is their job and you always have to work around the notes. You can't just say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. No, we're not doing that. You always have to say, okay, this is how we are addressing blah, blah, blah. And a lot of it then becomes politics. You're suddenly halfway a diplomat trying to, to protect the project against notes that you clearly feel are harmful while giving the executive the feeling that they have a positive impact on the, on the project, which you don't have to deal with in independent 
filmmaking. So it's really a, a clear trade-off. They give you the money to do something, which is ex ex extremely comfortable, not having to raise money to make your movie, which is such a which bogs you down in independent filmmaking. Um, but they want to be heard, and there's a whole hierarchy of people that want to be heard with different tastes, different visions. So if in independent filmmaking you try to get your team to make the same movie, in a studio movie you have to get the executives and your team to make the same movie, which is sometimes twice as many people and makes it harder. Did you see Thank You for Smoking? So Rob Lowe's character. That's, that's, sort of, that's what I envision is this person that you said giving that, that notes. That, right. <laughs> you, know? you, you, you know that one minute in, it doesn't take long for the first meeting because there are, there are certain buzzwords that executives, I guess, in their 20-minute story training get told that they will use. And if someone uses that early on in a conversation, you know, like, oh, we are <laughs> you know. I'm just curious what they are. No, um, like one big thing is elevated genre. We want this to be elevated. Sure, like, what, is what that? does that okay. mean? Yeah, <laughs> They want smart genre, they want blah, 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 blah. Sure, but that doesn't help us with the development. Um, organic, the characters have to be organic. It has to be character driven. It's these words, they're all true, mm -hmm. but they are cliches. They came out of a good observation. Right. So if someone's only contribution during a first meeting is to ask for a character driven, elevated horror story, I know I'm in trouble because there's <laughs> not gonna be much actual help coming from, from that side, you know. Um, so just kind of like these catch, like I, I hear a lot of millennials use the words, it's so meta, and oh. I don't even know, right. like what, what, or it's so epic. Like, I, I, so those kind of buzzwords, because I'm still trying to wrap my head around, like, right. I know what the word means, but in the context of like daily life, how is that, how is that experience so meta? I don't right. know. Right, 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 right. Yeah, you're, you're. <laughs> Showing my age, but you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's, and, and, and you know that when you actually ask what that means and ask them to define that, there is, well, you, you know. I'm like, no, I don't know, what, what does that, how do you mean organic, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, right, right. Yeah, and then you'll also get certain, certain buzz phrases to, to question, like when you go like that and that, I think will be confusing, they will go like, oh, the audience today is smarter than that. <laughs> You're like, that, you can say that to every story problem, the audience today is smarter than that. That is not a, an approach to actually, you know. Mm -hmm. So when you get a series of those, those things, you kind of know that, yeah. Right, I see, yeah. yeah. Because my experience from the outside is always that everything looks so easy, and they had the greatest time, and the script was amazing, the, everything was incredible, and now I judge my experience actually making stuff and I'm like, oh, I'm on the wrong track here because my script is not amazing. Not everybody loves themselves, each other, blah, 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 blah. Right, so or themselves, yeah. Or, the, or themselves. <laughs> and and it's, just, it's just messy. I always had the feeling that whenever I get to talk to like a class of filmmakers or something, that I help them the most by saying, it is a messy process. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm scared. I don't have a vision when I get, I have to pretend I have a vision don't believe that every filmmaker that talks about it had this vision beforehand. It's messy and scary and, and painful. And you're not, if you experience those things, you're not on the wrong track, you're on the right track. You know? But yeah. a, a, lot of, a lot of these interviews, these PR interviews for movies, <laughs> obviously <laughs> don't allow you- It's nonsense. It, you, to do that. So you watch that <laughs> stuff and if anything, it'll, it'll hurt your career because you think it's, it's something different. So. Yeah, that's why I'm always like, why do people even ask questions that they have to know that I'm not, I can't answer truthfully because my career would be over. And to say, yeah. I hated that producer, or yeah. that studio is completely incapable, or that writer wrote complete bullshit. A, they don't deserve it for me to call them out like that because they don't get to do the opposite to me, with me. Um, and B, no one would hire me ever again. So. Don't, don't force me to lie on camera is what I always think in these press press interviews. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. I mean, a lot of those are just like, how is it, you know, I love the, the how is it like to work with Meryl Streep, you know, and you're, and it's, which is kind of an insult because you're not really there to talk to that person about Meryl Streep. Uh -huh. You're there to talk to, about, to that process, but so many of those junkets are like that. And yeah. I'll be nervous and hyperventilating beforehand. They'll be like, you're nervous, you know, and then and they come in, hey, you know, everything's great. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is very surface. Um, and I could see why people wouldn't want to do those junkets. 
I can definitely uh-huh, see uh-huh. it. You know, it is. It's five minutes, get to your point. Okay, bye, next. Yeah. You can't build a rapport with the person. We had a comment on our channel the other day, and it, it lends to something that we were just talking about off camera and just about having certain people on your production that are in your camp. And you said someone had given advice to someone you know. and Yeah, a friend of mine is a female um, director who's very successful in TV right now. And when she, before she did her first episode, she asked some other huge TV director, I forget who that was, um, if you had to give me one piece of advice, what would that be? And he said, make sure you have someone that is on your team, meaning that has not been hired by production, has not been suggested by the producers, but someone that you have worked with and trust and that you bring into the project. Um, which is, doesn't seem obvious in the beginning because you are so taken by all the great talented people that production is throwing at you that you are happily taking that one, that one, that one. Um, and in the beginning, everything is rosy anyway. The energy is like everybody's excited. <laughs> there are no problems. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. But I think the, pro- the, the process is one where no matter how great the producers are that you work with, I always look at them in the beginning and go like, I know we're going to have a screaming fight at some point. It doesn't matter how great they are. It's just, it's like you're going through this war together. You're exhausted and you don't have 100% overlapping worldview and creative views. Otherwise, you'd be the same person. Just by virtue of not being the same person, that friction, especially with the money involved, will at some point lead to the moment where you find yourself on set, being screamed at by that person, screaming at that person, and having to figure out the next moment after that. So that's always what I'm in my mind jumping ahead to and go like, do I want to do that with that person? Does that person seem reasonable and human enough that we will survive that moment and it's not going to taint everything into bitterness? And then uh, connected to that is this bring your own person because you will find yourself in a situation where everything is so crazy and there are conflicts and you are not completely sure that it's not you going crazy. Especially because if production comes with all their people, they owe each other loyalty. Like if you have a TV show, for example, where they've already done 10 episodes, I'm doing the 11th episode. This whole team has me on set for a week, but knows that the next year of their employment depends on being in good graces with the producers. If there now is a conflict, you will not suddenly have the team stand up for you, which on a, on a movie set you would because you put the team together, you stuck your heads together creatively to make this happen. And if there's a conflict with the money side of things, you are anchored in your creative people that give you the, the, the confidence that you are pursuing the right thing for the right reason. In TV, you don't have that, for example. So what she was saying to even have one person there where she brought her cinematographer, um, where, where she said, no, I want to hire my own cinematographer, blah, 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 made a world of a difference because she knew that she had one ally on set. And again, that's really hard and sounds very negative to think of conflict in the beginning when everything is just fireworks and everything is great. But I think that's a smart way to do. And if, it, if there is no conflict, I have I've yet to see that set where there is no conflict. But if that <laughs> happens to be the case, then great. you know. But at least you have some kind of insurance of having someone who has your back and is not beholden to the producers. Well, there's a honeymoon phase for everything, whether it's a new job, whatever it is. So yeah, everyone's going to be on their best behavior. Right. And, and then people's preferences and quirks and everything comes out later and then yeah are you able to recover from it and still be cordial and professional with each other even after a blow up right or does that person hold a grudge and and then to have someone in your own camp I think that's great and also as a sounding board somewhat not not as like a full emotional sounding board but someone to basically you can run something by like was that when I gave that was that clear right and and I think that's helpful and in that context the greatest thing of course if you can bring someone on that you've worked with before that can give you context of oh, what we did we did it before like that what they want now is different but mom who can see what you do in a context with a little bit of background I think is super helpful that's maybe a luxury to have that you have someone who is uh, as professional like functions on that high a level that the production would say yes we will hire your person 
instead of our person. That is probably hard to achieve, but if it can be achieved, then that is a big plus, I think. What if a filmmaker finds themselves in a situation where they can tell their, that the production is running away from them and they are, it feels like their head spinning and everyone's sort of got their own agenda. How, how do they make it through, even if they say, okay, this is not gonna go well, but I need to, I'm contractually, you know, I'm contractually obliged to continue this and I'm gonna stay there and, and tough it out. How do you kind of keep your sanity? I think that is the answer. What you just said, you just, <laughs> you're, you're there. I, it hasn't happened to me in, in that bad a form and I do wonder that myself because it's so demanding to be on set even in the best of circumstances that if it's a nightmare atmosphere continually over days and weeks, I don't know how people, how people do it, but I guess if you are getting paid for it, then you just concentrate on that and go like every day that I'm on set, I'm getting paid. And if I was working in an office environment, I would hate it too, but I'd go to get paid. So I'm doing that now and I'm trying to not lose my, my sanity. And then if that can be achieved at all, I'm always trying to remind myself how cool it is that I get to do this and that I get to see this, even if it's a nightmare, how amazing that I get to see an Oscar winning actor be a diva and be hated by everyone, but I get to see it from the first row. <laughs> like I'm in Hollywood, how great is that? And you always forget that because you're so in it and you're like, oh, I hate this and I don't want to get to set, blah, blah, blah. But if you have a little bit of a distance, which in TV is much easier because it's not your baby that you have written and nurtured over years and you now see fall apart, but it's an episode that someone else wrote and you are just there to kind of make it literally through the day. And then it's a little bit easier, I think, to step back. But again, then it helps if you can turn to someone at the end of the day and can roll your eyes with them and you know that that wasn't a normal day. Whereas if you don't have that person and you start getting the feeling that you are the one that is off and that this is a normal condition that you're working with, I think then it can really kind of eat away at you. Sure. And that's where you just kind of keep it to, wow, great weather today. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very surface. I mean, at, at some point, really, it's about making, making it through the day and shooting the stuff that is on the page. Keep shooting, keep shooting, keep shooting. It's really, in the end, um, the only recipe. You just have to really let go of plans that you had and how you imagined this. If you get, I think, caught in the spiral of frustration, I have that I'm, I'm a, in a, not in a good way, a perfectionist in that I get very demotivated very quickly if I have the feeling we're compromising quality, right? And that then and adds up because I'm, if we do it in the, in the first day, I'm already in day two, slightly less motivated to achieve what in my delusional mind I think will be this great cultural masterpiece, right? And, and so then you get, you, I have to, be careful not to get caught up in the frustration of that because every day it will be worse because the first day you compromise, the second day you have to compromise before because you compromised the first day. So the third day and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the end you get, you could get to the dangerous moment of I don't care anymore, you know, and to, to, to save yourself from that. I think it's, it's good to let go a little bit in the beginning and almost ideally see the humor in it and go like, let's see where this goes. But I still have to deliver obviously the pages that we have to shoot every day. And then we'll see in editing if we can save this thing. That's probably how that would go. He basically said his, he sees his role as the director, as the person, the host of a party. And he has to make sure everybody is comfortable and likes coming. And then whatever happens, happens. There's only so much you can steer in the moment, but it's about whom you invite and that you create an atmosphere where they can work the best and then to just keep looking after their well-being, which I thought was genius. It's just like I'm not that person on set. I've seen directors that are literal cheerleaders. <laughs> like they will make sure that everybody has a blast all the time. I need someone else, I need an AD who does that or something because I'm not, I'm in real life, not enough of a party animal to create that kind of, but sure. on set when I'm working, much less, much less. And I have to tell act actors that in the beginning that they don't think my German demeanor is 
I'm miserable right now, but that's just what I look like when I'm working. It's not the continuous well of, of joy, um, <laughs> which is okay though with, I think it's okay with the people that I work with one-on-one -on -one creatively because we have kind of, I think they appreciate the, the down-to-earthness much more rather than the party-party thing. Right. But for the overall atmosphere on set, of course, that is then not in my purview so much. Whether people, I, and I couldn't tell you after the shoot if people behind the scenes had a great time. I don't know because I was so focused on my thing. And yeah. in the end, I think from the outside, it always looks as if the director has to deal with 500 people because the teams are so big. But really, it doesn't make a difference if I'm shooting a little student film where I only have my cinematographer, my roommate is the cinematographer and I have two actors, is the same as if there are 500 other people around. I'm still just working with the cinematographer and with the actors. I'm not dealing with the catering people. I'm not taking with the gaffer who has to bring a light from where. From the outside, it looks like this huge machine that you suddenly have to control. But in the end, it's about three or four people in a room doing their thing, right? So that atmosphere to me is very, very, very important. But whether the gaffer is going out with the catering person or not, I don't know. I can't control and I don't really care about it. You know? So that's, that's where my party ends. My party are these couple of people, the actors, the cinematographer, the operator, maybe one of the producers, if the writer is on set, the writer. But we, are, we would fit into this room easily. And then there's a party out there that, that I can't control. And I think people figure that out very quickly, that I'm not the you know, kind of sh party, <laughs> party host. Um, and I think it's okay with everyone, hopefully. I remember one gentleman addressed the crowd before something that we were all gonna work and he just said, look, I'm French. If I ask you to do something in the moment, it'll sound really bad, but I'm not mad at you. Genius. And it was funny Genius. and we all, we all relaxed. And yeah, it was actually a super nice guy. And, right. But the, the fact that he kind of like made light of it, right. made you feel like safe with him. Ah, I'm gonna do that from now on, <laughs> that is genius. It was great. That's very good, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. When you sign on to direct a TV show, how much prep time are you given? Contractually, I think they have to give me the script 24 hours before shooting starts. So that's not a lot, really. And it has to do with, that, with the fact that I am not expected to have creative input into development and into the script at all. I'm being hired to direct what's on the page. I would say in, in in, in real terms, how that plays out, I usually have about a week, I would say. And that's when I, because I'm coming from the screenwriting background, so I have opinions on the script, for better or for worse, and whether I'm right or not is a different thing. But I have the feeling I'm kind of failing this, this episode if I'm not voicing my suggestions, which I'll, I'll just write up sent to the showrunner and whatever of that they want to incorporate, great. Whatever they don't want to incorporate, great too. I, that's the, the only time I ever suggest that in the writing stage because then I have the feeling I've done my work. I've contributed my filter as, as the audience reading it fresh basically, which I think is important for them to know because they hired me as a director. So to hear about my filter and my feelings and my maybe red flags where I feel like this or that will be hard to bring out the way that I think they want it. I'd say that once. Um, and whatever they reject, I know that they've already worked on it so long and so many people had to give their okay to green light it that I can't come in and change everything. But that ship has sailed, you know. And that was something that took some getting used to doing TV at first. Um, and then I go in the time that I have, depending on how much time I, I have to sit with it, I'm going through every single scene and I have this kind of questionnaire of 36 questions that I ask myself for every scene so that because, because when I first did it I didn't have it written down it was kind of a whatever question I could think of that I would would consider with the scene I did and so much time was wasted on remembering the questions that at some point I was like if I just and I have like a simplified one for TV with I think 17 questions or something and now I just kind of tick them off, bum, 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 answer them and to me the great thing is that with some questions if you force yourself to answer them, like there would be something like in, in what way does the lighting inform the mood and the scene? Whose, whose scene is it? 
uh, through whose eyes do we see things? What is the one takeaway that the audience has to understand in terms of information? Um, what is the one visual image that I want them to carry away? Blah, 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 all those things. And some, some questions don't seem to apply at all at first. And if you force yourself to still think of an answer, they are always the most fruitful ones because you suddenly realize, oh, it applies big time. Like one, one question would be, for example, if you run completely out of time, how do you cover the scene in the shortest amount of time? And just knowing that, that I have that in my back pocket gives me a lot of security on set because I know if all our, there's this saying, it's, I'll butcher that saying, as you always say, um, it's Citizen Kane in the morning and it's the Duke of Hazards in the afternoon <laughs> or something, which is so true. Like you come in the morning, you have all, oh, we'll do this and this. And then at the end of the day, it's just like somehow get the stuff in camera that we have that scene. So when that kicks in, I want to be prepared for that. I don't hope for that to happen, but I want to be prepared for it. Or if you wanted to shoot the entire scene in one take, how would you do that? Or which, how do you want to shoot the scene? And if you were forced to do it another way, what would you do? And just by forcing yourself into, oh, that would, be, would have been my go-to way of shooting this. Those are the images that come to mind in the very beginning, instinctively. But if I force myself to put a pin in that, and come up with an alternative way for whatever reason, there is, the more resistance I have to that, the more interesting stuff comes out of the answer to this question. That's all a very long-winded say, the way of, of saying, preparing for that stuff. But I, I'll do that with the, um, with the scenes that seem the most important. And then the way I structure it, which has served me well, is that I don't start preparing scenes with scene one and then go through but I start preparing scenes depending, prioritizing them by which scene needs the most answers in terms of physical stuff. Because I know that as soon as I come, wherever we're shooting, the prop master will answer, want answers, the production designer wants answers. Everybody who has to make something materialize needs some time, needs some prep time to do that, right? So if there's a scene that has Let's say there is the book of the dead, the magical book of the dead, right? It would be, I, I know that the second that prop master comes up to me, the clock is ticking for him or her to get me the best possible version of this book of the dead. So every day that I go like, oh, I haven't thought about that, give me a day, the quality of that book will be reduced and put that person under more stress. Whereas if I can immediately give them an answer and go like, this is how I picture that, boom, 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 they have more time to work on it, I get the better result, right? So in the beginning, when I first was preparing episodes, I was kind of preparing the most uh, character intensive ones first, because they felt the most important storytelling ones. But that was exactly the wrong way to go because the character stuff is stuff that doesn't have a physical component to it that has to materialize. I can still rehearse with the actors pretty short notice. They don't need to know a week in advance that I'm looking for a certain character moment. That is pretty, it seems important in the story, but in the physical um, nature of the overall thing, it's not. And then I just write, knowing that other people need time to think about stuff too, I write down the questions that I want to answer, that, that I want to ask certain departments and that I want to ask, first of all, the showrunner. Because I don't want to work for a week and then I have the meeting with the showrunner and I realize that they have a completely different approach to our different look or whatever, whatever, whatever. So I need my basic, com basic answers to know what our playing field is to realize this episode. Now, of course, I've watched the, ideally all the episodes that are leading up to my episode so that I understand the, the language of the show and the look of the show um, and all that. I, the, the one case where I wasn't able to do it was my Fear the Walking Dead episode where I had, it was very short notice and I had watched the first season but then didn't watch all the episodes leading up to mine but I was like, I'll get away with it, they will, the actors won't know. And they immediately knew, like there, was, there were one or two conversations and they immediately know you haven't watched the last because you are asking me to do stuff that I have done last episode. And, you know, so I'll never pretend again. I'll just say, I'm sorry, I didn't watch the last episode. So, but if I can obviously watch the whole 
build up to it, which in reality, obviously you only get so far until you hit episodes that haven't, that are not out yet. So then you try to get the scripts for those episodes, read the scripts. You try, if you can, get the rough cut, which sometimes already exists off the episode before yours. Like the more information you can get about the lead up into your show, I think the better. Um, and then I always try to meet every actor one on one um, because you have so little time to build a rapport with actors in TV um, that even if you have 10 minutes with them by yourself, they are forced to form a relationship with you. Whereas if you do that with three people in the room, sometimes the producer wants to be there and I'm always saying, don't, don't take this personally, but I'd rather do it on my own. Yeah. Because a group dynamic is something that will happen quickly enough, but on set you do need the relationship with each actor on a, on a private level as much as possible. That was a very long answer. But. What if you only have 24 hours to prepare all of that prep work, watching episodes, reading scripts, all of that stuff sounds wonderful. But if you're given it 24 hours in advance, that's got to be really scary because now you've got to choose what's most important that I do. Right. I've never had it in real life, luckily, that I had only 24 hours, but that is the DGA mandated minimum. I think my, my shortest was uh, one week. I mean, you then cut corners. You watch on, on YouTube, you watch the recap for the episodes, the two minutes thing, what happened now. You read the Wikipedia episode entries that tell you what happened in, so that you at least have the story arc down. You watch the pilot for sure. You maybe watch if there's any behind the scenes footage where the producers are talking, that's worth watching on YouTube because you get a feel for what kind of people they are. And then going through the script, you would probably reduce your, your character stuff to what does the character want in this scene? Where are they starting out? Where are they ending up? What's their want? Um, because it feels like that is the minimum of what you need to know going into a scene, working with an actor, their, their, their want, that every person in this scene has an objective, what is that? And if you have that, then you can probably walk in, especially with TV where everybody has played their characters for a while and knows their character better than you do, you're probably okay walking into that. Um, yeah, and in terms of the, the, the physical stuff, it's, it is probably worth trying to communicate with the departments already and don't wait until the producers introduce you to the prop master because that might be days and days and days later but try to be like proactively write an email to the production say can I have the email address of the costume designer of the, of the prop master email them directly and tell them what you want you know start a conversation with them because every minute counts in the end everything is so stressful that if you can get a head start by a day or two, it makes everything much, much easier, much more doable. The 36 questions that you have, do you, you literally have them typed out? Yeah. That's yeah. great. I've done less and less now. I would say maybe I'm doing 20 now or something <laughs> because you just get, it takes a while. Like for a movie, I would still do that. If I know I have one year before I'm shooting, I would still do 36 questions for, and I would storyboard every scene because I always have the feeling if I've, that the main goal of this whole of the questionnaire is to force yourself to spend 10 minutes inside of that scene, whichever way. Just be there with the scene, think of nothing else other than this scene, so that when you do it on set, it feels like territory that you've stood in once before. That's not the first time I'm now thinking about it, but it's like, and that's why I'm storyboarding stuff. I can storyboard it all, looks terrible, no one can decipher my storyboards, doesn't matter, that's not what it's about and I'm not going to shoot the storyboards. It's just a method to force myself to intensely think about the scene for a second. Um, and you always come up with something. It's not that, I think Nick Cave said that, that about his muse and whatever, he said that the only job that he has is to show up at 9 o'clock in the morning and sit at the piano and don't leave until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. That's the only pressure he feels that's his entire job. And whatever happens in that time happens. And with this preparation process, I have that feeling. It, it, the, at first you go like, oh, I'm not going to come up with anything. And every scene looks banal. It's two people walking down the street. There is no subtext. What am I even doing here? But two minutes later, just sitting there, 
you go like, oh my God, this is a metaphor for his walk to the gallows. And if I shoot it from here, you know, just through sheer, I guess, boredom or something to sit with it, you always come up with something interesting. And in TV or ev everywhere, maybe, I always have the feeling if I find one thing that interests me about the, the scene, one thing that where I get up in the morning and go like, oh, today I want to do that. I'm looking forward to that. I have to find that in the scene where they are walking down the street somehow. And you always find it, you know. And that one interesting thing always also, or most of the time, informs the one direction that you give your team. Because the last thing that a team wants, obviously, is for you to do a big speech, 15 minutes long in the morning, about how you see the scene, how the scene reminds you of your mother, blah, 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 blah. If the, but if you can give one direction where it's like, let us treat this letter that the character has put on the table as if it's nuclear waste. That's how I want it shot. That's how I want every blah, 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 blah. It's the as if thing. It's an actress said that to me once. I asked her, what is she looking for in a, in a direction? And she said, um, a code word, a key basically to open up whatever that opens up, which to me like changed everything because it was before, because before that I was that person who would kind of give these big speeches that I had thought out before, blah, blah, blah. Help no one because no one can process all that stuff. But since I know that, that unlocking key thing, um, that's really what it is because now everybody can make their decisions in, in connection with this one thing that I put out there and it changes everything. It changes everybody's approach to the scene and suddenly a scene is not generic anymore because that is the big problem. Fincher, I think, said that it's not, directing is not about what all you do, it's about what you not do and that's how you define style, which is true. It's so intimidating to think here's a scene and you could shoot it whichever way. From wherever, which with whatever lens, bum 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 bum. How do you make decisions? And I think that a lot of directors or beginning directors get completely lost in that and go like, I, I don't know. So if you find one thing that you base it on, it anchors everything and it informs most of your answers. Some things it won't have any effect on, but whether I put the camera here with the letter in the foreground or over here without the letter, suddenly there will be an answer to it because I know that this letter is important and I want to treat it like a dangerous nuclear waste artifact. So I shoot it differently. So this, I think this one as if thing, I would, if I only had 24 hours, I would try to find that for every scene, find the want of each character. It would be stressful 24 hours to do that, but that would kind of be the minimum preparation that you probably would want to do. And when you talked about the fear of the blank page with screenwriting, mm. it sounds like there's a similar thing with storyboarding. Right. Oh, see, now you are there. So there would be such a thing as director's block, which would be exactly that. You can do anything. So what do you do? It's the same as the blank page. I'm, I've just invented this story, uh, this bedtime story book, because I can't tell bedtime stories. If you said, tell me a story, I, is there's, there's a prince, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just talked to a friend yesterday and he said what he does is he is asking their child for three words and then he will tell a story. So if the child says toilet bowl, tiger and bracelet, then he suddenly out of infinite options of what to tell has zeroed in on three things that he will now connect to something and make work somehow, which to me was genius, which was what I was trying to do with that book and much more complicated. He really distilled it down to something very simple. But I think it's the same, it's the same with finding that one, the approach um, to the scene. And there's all, all this language around it that is so intimidating and scary where people are like, oh, I want to hear your vision. And the production designer goes, what's, what's your vision for this? And secretly you go like, I don't have a vision. But you can't say, I don't have a vision. But I think that's important not to be intimidated by, but they just want that one word, the key to how are they supposed to approach this thing. And if you just give them one, that it's like this place has to feel really lived in or he hasn't you know, tidied up in two weeks, it opens a whole different door for them and their department. You know, or you want, if you talk to the cinematographer, you really want to feel the presence of his dead parents by the shadows on the wall. Though. In, to the cinematographer, it immediately means, aha, uh -huh, so we have to, we need light sources that are low so that the 
shadows are being thrown up on the wall. So now the cinematographer has to talk to production design to get those lamps and motivate those. It's a whole chain of events, but you have now given them the direction that they can work inside of their department and with other departments without your constant input. And then you just have to, tr you have to trust that you're working with good people that know what they're doing, where you don't have to micromanage where exactly that lamp has to stand, but you know what the effect is that you're going for. And the effect you're going for is, and that goes full circle to what we talked about earlier, they are going back to what do you want the audience to experience. You know, it, it helps if you know, do you want the audience to feel comfortable in the space of the protagonist, or do you want it to feel spooky, or do you want it to feel sterile, or do you blah, 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 because it means something else for every department. But once you figure out that one word, comfortable or sterile or blah, 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 everybody knows what to do with it. But before you give them that one code word, they don't know which direction to work into. With TV, it's a little bit different again, because that world has already been established and they already know the vocabulary of the world and they kind of already know those answers. But if you are doing a movie where that world only has to be you know, created, that's where that is vital. I know from just doing background work like 15 years ago that some sets moved very fast. Like I can remember being on ER and I mean, the way, I mean, the, I was like, I'm supposed to walk and do my crawl. I, could, I couldn't keep up, whereas other sets were slower. It seemed like ER was almost like this circular motion that they had everybody kind of move. They move the camera in and they're going around this one room where everyone's in these hospital beds and you're either an orderly or whatever. And the, the pace of that set was incredibly fast and everybody knew their role uh -huh. and they had pretty much designated regular extras and I was just like a fill-in uh -huh. and I didn't know how, which way was which whereas other ones it was had been established just very recently and right. you know you're sitting in a church pew crying or whatever and it was just a slower thing right so it's just interesting how certain sets and the dynamic of the scene or the sets or the show is just a faster pace. Right. Well, that I think has to do with has that set been established? If they shot 500 episodes in there, they don't have to figure out how to shoot that set every time anew. But there's like, you know, a kind of process. Whereas if it's a church that we have, we're shooting in for the first time, you do have to figure out these, all these things. Which lens does that way of the church look the best? Blah blah blah. It's all trial and error, whereas with the set that you've shot on again and again, the trial and error phase is over and you just kind of go right to the, to the effect. Right. With the actors and pulling them aside, I find that very interesting because you're right that people behave differently with other people around. And then was that something that you've heard other directors do, that they, they like to speak to the actor one-on-one -on -one without the handlers or whatever around? Because people will receive your message differently and they'll behave yeah. differently. I, I haven't talked to other directors about it, but I know that some productions asked me, do you want to meet them before so and so? So I know that it's, it must be a known thing out there that some directors want to do that. Um, and I'm sure that every director uses that time differently. Because I, in the beginning, was like, oh, I'm going to go through the script with them and we're going to analyze blah, 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 blah. By now, it's mostly we're talking about their pets or my pets or whatever, you know. It's really not even about that we, that we sit over the material together, but really just about that we spend one moment together where neither of us are pretending and playing for a bigger audience, but it's really just us in the moment. Um, and you always go back to that initial connection um, that, that you have. I think that's like the best spent 20 minutes of an entire shoot is kind of that alone time, oh, and no matter what you do. That's great. Yeah, playing for an audience. That's really that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, I think it works the same in, in interviews as well. When there's less people around, right. you get a, a much different vibe than if you do a junket and people don't see that there's 10 people in the room. Right. And it, it is a different feeling. Yeah. Are there common traits that a horror protagonist has to have? A humanity that makes us care about them. I thought that was very succinctly said. I like that. Yeah, that's <laughs> no, great. Yeah, uh -huh. that's, that's the only yeah. thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had touched on this a little bit earlier, but yeah, sort of that moment where you feel like even if you find out negative things about them halfway through the movie that they've established something that's given them a likability and that we can relate to. Yeah, we just want to care whether someone lives or dies. I think it's as it sounds like a very low bar, but I think it's actually really hard to achieve. 
with, with our protagonists to make the audience care whether they live or die. Give them a, an actual reason that can be verbalized and that, that works. So it's much easier, you think, in comedy or, or a dramatic? No, I think it's the same there. I think it's the same there. Pro maybe in drama even more because you have nothing to distract the audience with. And with horror, in the worst case scenario, you have horror pieces that you can distract the audience with. And even if they don't care about the protagonist, they still come out and go like, can talk about horror pieces. And with comedy, maybe the jokes still land. With drama, obviously, you're dead in the water if no one cares about your protagonist. But I would say that in broad brushstrokes, that's the case with all genres. What do you think the decade uh, appeals to you most for filmmaking, whether what, whatever genre it is? I'm a child of the 90s. I can't help it. I, can't, I have no outside view on how high quality that was. I think people that know a lot more about film than me would definitely not pick the 90s as their favorite episode, uh, favorite uh, era. But I would say I grew up with the, with the films of the 80s and the 90s, and they, they are still the ones that, that spark that initial joyful child in me. Like, and it doesn't matter if it's, if obviously, if the films were great. I think the greatest time I've ever had in a movie theater was during Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. <laughs> I don't know if that was a great movie or not, but I know that if I had to pick one the moment of my movie going experience that I would want to snapshot and go like that's what why it's an undescribable joy to, to watch movies to make movies all of that it would be Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade so yeah the the 80s and the 90s I guess well something about that theater experience as a kid is, is really magical you know because yeah you're there with your friends you're eating away from your parents, you're eating stuff that you're not supposed to eat. And it was just like a fun, fun movie. And you're not yet intellectualizing it and going like, is it cool to laugh about that joke? Is it? There was no cynicism to it. There was just a pure, you know, a story experience and loving every second of it. I don't know. Was this here in the States? No, that was when I was 12 or whenever that came out in Germany. Yeah. And did a lot of American films make it to the... Yeah. Set? Hollywood was like the main. It was actually very, the Ger German film was very out of vogue. I can't remember, I think, I can't remember during my childhood ever watching a German movie. That wasn't something. They were kind of, they weren't known for their humor or for their kind of spectacle or anything. It was all Hollywood movies dubbed into German, but the same, same movies. And some of them were so well dubbed, like Star Wars to this day, I prefer in German, because <laughs> it was so well dubbed and the voices were so distinct and memorable. Maybe it's just that I watched it during my childhood and that's why they're like in my bones, these voices. Um, Forrest Gump, I thought, was much better in, in German than in English. <laughs> so, you know. But American movies all the way through, for sure. Someone on Twitter had responded to a tweet that we sent out and the tweet was a video we did, which is, what scripts does Hollywood want? Most screenwriters are writing the wrong ones. And so we had a gentleman ask, well, you know, this is a pivotal issue. Do I write what I know and what moves me, or do I write what producers are looking for? So I know this is a sort of a ever going question. It might also not be as black and white because what you know uh, and what moves you might not have to be so literal. You know, just because you were, whatever, a painter doesn't mean that you have to write a script about painting, but it could be any creative obsession, right? It could be any subtext in that or any, anything that you, I think, emotionally know is different from the specifics of the literal translation of that. So if you can make those two things overlap, um, for example, I'm working on a TV show right now that has a lot to do with ambition. Um, and, and obviously the, the protagonist in that show pushes it to the maximum where I in real life have never pushed it, but I know what it feels like to have an ambition where you get to the point where you say, I, I would do anything, I would kill, I would die. This has to, I have to do this, right? So then I can take that feeling and infuse it into my character, but that doesn't mean that that character necessarily literally needs to wants to achieve the same thing that I wanted to achieve back then. So I think if, if there is any way to 
I think it's definitely wrong to reject this notion because I hear that again and again at film schools when I, when I meet the, uh, the graduating class or something. There is this vibe of stick to your guns, don't sell out. Where I'm always like, I'm good luck with that one. But if there's any way for you to not stick to your guns and sell out and still tell the story that you want to tell well, that might be the greatest version of it all because you will not change Hollywood. You will not suddenly, your stuff just won't get made. You know? And if you want to do the indie thing, great. And there might be change and you might be part of change, but that's a very slow process. So if you, instead of rejecting what producers want and what the mainstream is, and instead of labeling that as purely negative, but just going, can I give them what they think is going to be commercial and popular? Because I want my movie to be seen by as many people as possible too. If I don't have to compromise and sacrifice the, the essence and the DNA of the story that I'm passionate about, then I would try to achieve that. So maybe that's, that's an answer to that. It's, I don't think it's either or. You just have to ignore the screaming of both sides that are making it sound as if it's one or the other and just come from your story side and, and see if you can com combine both into, into one and make both worlds work for you and for your story rather than working against either of those. It reminds me of a quote I saw on someone's, it was a bumper sticker I saw, I can still remember, it was like many years ago and it is, in order to change the system you have to become part of the system and I'm sure it's, I, I'll look it up and it'll be like, oh it's so-and-so said that. But that sounds like it's similar for making movies in some sense. I'm sure there are very, a lot of different ways to go. I just know that the, the, the single focus on stick to your guns and don't compromise is, is not the wisest answer. Um, and I'm, I'm, there are definitely examples probably where people did that and they changed the world and they changed film and all that. So I, I don't want to poo-poo on that either, but it's just, it's not as easy as film schools will have it sound as if it's like the go-to thing. Of course, I'm an artist and of course I won't compromise and of course I'll stick to my guns. If you can work with Hollywood, if you are in Hollywood and you can work with Hollywood, it might, you might go faster than if you have to work against Hollywood. Mm. Makes sense. In 2012, when we interviewed you the first time, you talked about how Hollywood is based on selling promises, or I think that's what we entitled the video. That was a good title too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's Almost David so here. that w once you've read the headline, <laughs> you don't have to watch the video anymore. <laughs> it's all in there. Yeah. You can thank David for that. Um, do you f still feel this way? Very much, 100%. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that those are two different jobs, the directing and doing a good job with the actual material and selling in the room what you are intending to do with the material, that those are two completely different things. And that the, the promises, um, you just have to, if you don't have the confidence, which I'm not that person, I'm not the car salesman usually, you just have to pretend and just, you know, talk about it as if this is how it's going to be and this is what you're going to achieve and all your self-doubt, which again you will have. In interviews you always have the feeling that filmmakers are always clear on what they want to achieve and how they want to achieve it and with whom they want to achieve it. Everything was great. There's the product. That's not how it really works. I think there's a lot of self-doubt along the way that you kind of have to get through. But you really, I have the feeling for me at least, I have to put that on pause for the 45 minutes that I'm walking into that meeting and just be, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be as authentic and genuine with everybody as possible, you know. In that room, I, I'm, I have to be someone else for that time because they don't want the creative soul that is, you know, blah, blah, blah. They want the, the, a manager, they want a business leader that give, will bring them the product that they are paying for. Um, and that makes Hollywood very much based on promises on pitches. On, there are a lot of different names for it, but in the end it's just you promise a creative outcome that in the moment you really have no right of promising at all. Um, and everybody plays along and pretends that that's not the case. So, What do you say to filmmakers who get so excited and inadvertently push their project out before it's ready? And then there, it's not perfect. Uh, of course, It'll never be perfect, but there's maybe, 
they should have taken more time, six months, whatever. But they want to rush it. They want to say, I have another film finished or I have my first film finished. I don't know if I have anything to say to them because it's a, it's a feeling that I've never had. I'm the opposite. Like I'm, I would sit on it forever if I could until someone rips it off my hand and goes like, good enough. And it still doesn't feel good enough. And I still feel like a fraud somehow with it now. So if they, if they have that confidence that they've made something and they want it out the door and they don't have any second thoughts about it, I would almost say go for it. I know that the, the conventional wisdom from from film festivals and all is this don't submit it to us before it's finished finished but I always wonder if that's a little bit of a self-serving thing because film festivals get flooded with projects anyway so it makes sense for them to say don't send it to us before you're finished with it um, but for you as the filmmaker if you feel okay that this is close enough to the best version that it than it can be and you are okay with people watching it, I would say go for it, which is not the responsible advice to give probably. But I don't, I don't know how much better it really, there's always this theory that, and now I'm getting the numbers wrong probably, that you have to put in 80%, what is it, 20% of the work to get something to 80% of its potential and the last 20% is where you spend the last 80% of your work which is very much my experience. And I have friends that are totally living in these 80%. They just have an idea, they have momentum, they do the 20% input, have 80%, everybody sees the potential, it's great, out the door, next project. Whereas I will spend the next two years trying to get the last, two, that's the perfectionism thing, getting the last 20% right. And in the end, I would say my friends who have done three or four projects by the time that I've done one, they might have one complete gold nugget out of their four projects that might be better than mine. So it's just a different way of, of working. Um, so if, if someone works like that, I would say go with it. Because how much better, and it's hard for you to judge while you're making it, but how much better is it realistically going to be if you invest another half a year? Is that something that only you, because you're so in it, feel, but that someone else who hasn't seen it and watches it for the first time, it would be an unnoticeable difference, then I would say good for you for pushing it out the door sooner. I definitely think that exposing your baby to the world as soon as possible, if you can stomach it, will always benefit the project rather than sitting on it too long and having things get too rigid and too hard to change. I've had that a couple of times that I showed something where we were just about to lock the cut to a friend who had a comment where I was like, I wish I had heard that half a year ago. That is genius. That would have made the whole movie so much better, but now it's too late because we're about to lock. It was totally my fault for showing that to people too late because I was too precious about it and I should have been more daring and more courageous and opening it up to animosity, to criticism earlier because there was still time to react then. Wow, so yeah, I guess you can hold on to something for too long then. Definitely. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. I mean, sure. There are people that are still writing their first screenplay 40 years later because it's not good enough, not good enough, not good enough, which I totally get. But obviously every film that has ever been made had a screenwriter push out his or her script before it was perfect. Otherwise the movie would not exist right now. So I think either way can be a problem. Yeah. How many screenplays have you been working on over the last five years? A lot more than I've, that have been made into movies, that's for sure. Um, I would say I've developed or worked with someone on developing it on five or six, probably more. Maybe up, up to ten, I would say. One we've developed for a long time for a studio, um, which then took one afternoon for the new boss. That is a classic story. You develop something with one executive at the helm who loves the project and then they get fired, unrelated to the project. The next generation comes in and goes, oh, we don't, we don't want that kind of movie. And it doesn't, it's not about the quality of the script, it's about they don't want to make that movie right now. And then you're So there is, that's, I think, maybe the, the hidden thing that you never see about directing, that the majority of work you do on stuff that never makes it to the screen and that you never get paid for. And that's just an investment that you have to make and that hopefully works out because some of the stuff does get made, which again, that's where the jumping on greenlit projects comes from, because there you have less of that fallout where you've just worked 
needlessly into the void and then nothing ever comes of it. Um, but I would say some of the best scripts that I've ever worked on are the ones that have not been made. You know? And that's what the whole the blacklist is based on, right? It's just a list of the greatest scripts that have never been made. Um, so someone had to sit on those and develop those and they probably weren't paid for it. So I'm doing a lot of that work that you always have to push away in the back of your head that you might be doing this in vain right now because it's so much work and so much. You have to put in the same amount of emotion and, and put importance on it as if as you do on the ones that are then getting made because you don't know which are the ones that are getting made and which ones are the ones that are not getting made. So it can be heartbreaking, um, but that's part of the job, I think. How many different screenwriters are you working with? I, I have one, um, David Burke, who is a genius screenwriter that I've done a couple of scripts with, and he rewrote Last Exorcism, he wrote, wrote 13 Sins. Um, he's amazing, so I'll work with him whenever I can, but a lot of times, the scripts come with other writers attached. And then if producers um, are championing the, the scripts, I will work with that writer who wrote the initial draft. So I would say these 10 scripts over the last couple of years maybe had five different writers on them, or six different writers. What's the most challenging part of finishing a screenplay for you? probably finishing that screenplay because there are still so many, in my case, there are still so many things that need fixing. Um, but if, if we waited for me to fix all the things that I think need fixing, it would never see the light of day. So it's always been the case, which I guess is a good problem to have, that producers are going, this is great, this is ready, let's do it, or let's not do it, or whatever the next step is, let's finish developing it, and I have to get myself to the point where I'm like, okay, I'll, I'm willing to let go. If it were the other way around, it'd be trickier, I guess. If I'm like, this is good enough and the producers are, no, it's not. I don't want to be in those shoes either. But my experience is more the opposite, that, that other people are ready to make something much quicker than I am. So that's kind of a difficult situation to be in. Is it the ending of the screenplay or is it the character arc? It, uh, what? Um it's, it's, it's throughout because there are, in a script there are obviously moments that work better and moments that work less well. But oftentimes you kind of leave the moment that's a little bit wonky in there just to, be, just to not lose momentum and you carry on. Because I think the writing process is less like people imagine it where it's like you write the first act and then you write the second act and by the time that you have reached the third act you're done with the script but you rewrite everything all the time in the first act maybe the most worked on because you already rewrite it as you're writing the other ones, you know. Um, so I don't, it's, it's not necessarily at the end or whatever, but it's all these wonky moments where during the writing process, during the draft, you go like, yeah, we'll get to that later. We'll do, it'll, it'll work for now, blah, blah, blah. And then if you're co-writing with someone, which is what I'm doing, that is where you then have slight differences of opinion somehow. What we get away with, what we don't get away with, what is believable, what's not believable. In the beginning, there's always a lot of agreement because we kind of see the broad brush strokes exactly the same. But the later it gets, the more we're discussing details all of a sudden where our views might be different. You know? And that's why I like working with David so much because once you have worked with someone, you know what that process looks like, where with other where other writers are, might be at each other's throats because you know, suddenly every detail matters so much. So it's definitely in the later stages where exhaustion kicks in. Also nothing for you feels fresh anymore. The jokes you've heard a million times, none of it seems funny. The scares aren't scary. Um, it's just, it's, it, there's a certain dullness that sets in that if someone reads it fresh, and that's why it's so important to then give it to someone because the other thing that they bring in other than having notes on it is an enthusiasm, hopefully, that you can feed off of, that you've long lost for you, it's just work, and it's oh, another draft, blah, blah, blah. And then you have someone read it for the first time and go like, this was hilarious and it was scary, but you go like, oh, I forgot, you know? And that gives you another couple of weeks of fuel to kind of carry on, it's a whole back and forth. What advice do you have for someone who's having trouble finishing a screenplay? I have no advice. Because that goes back to thinking that that's the, the hardest part of the whole thing. 
And that's part of why I don't write, because I would not have an answer to it. Because, I don't know, it's so ethereal, the whole thing, you know, either something presents itself or it doesn't. M maybe show it to other people, I guess. Show it to other people, open it up, don't be precious about it. Um, and just try to survive the feedback somehow. I'm always putting a little paper on my wall before I show anything to anyone and go like, this is feedback, it's supposed to be depressing, so that I can afterwards read it and go like, oh, I knew this before, because I forget it. When I get the feedback, I'm always thinking I'm so depressed because it surprised me and I thought the project was great and I get bad feedback. But then I look at the paper and I'm like, oh no, that's the process. I knew that before, that feedback. You, you do feedback to get negative feedback, otherwise it would not be valuable, right? You want stuff that didn't work for people, but of course when that hits you like a wave, so you have to be prepared for that, but I think other than that, probably showing it to other people is the only way to go. What do you want the audience to think and feel about something you've created? That it wasn't a waste of their time to consume it, first and foremost. Hopefully that they were entertained, hopefully that they feel it was smart and taking them, respecting them and their intelligence, um, that it felt true somehow, um, maybe emotionally or just that they, that they see snippets of what their experience as a human being in the world is um, and ideally that something surprised them um, but then after they saw it again it felt true to them. Um, yeah, I think, I think to forget for two hours that they are watching a movie because hopefully the acting is authentic enough and the story is engaging enough that you can just escape reality for, for two hours. So it doesn't even mean that they have to love it, it just means that they feel that it was real, that they were actually either an observer in a scene sitting across from the protagonist or just... I mean, it helps if they love it. I love if they love it. Um, it totally, that's, that's the added bonus. But I would, I would settle for, because that is such a high standard already these days that it's not a waste of your time because there's so much offered for you to consume. So to decide on something and afterwards have the feeling that that was the right choice and it was worthwhile watching, to me is already an extremely high bar. So I'll settle for clearing that, but if they then want to love it and recommend it to someone else, I'm, I'm over the moon. That's great. Of course. Has your view of directing evolved? Are you directing now the way you always have? Or things have changed? Your, your 36 questions that you either have in the back of your mind or the back of your pocket have, have been added to? Maybe in subtle ways, um, I got to the point where you, in film school you're always taught you can't, the bad director asks for a result, whereas the good director pushes the, the actor into exploring some blah 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 blah, which might all be true. Obviously like it's, it's frowned upon to say can you be angrier to an actress or an actor, um, which is totally true. But what that did to me at some point was that it totally paralyzed me because I was so aware of this minefield of what all is good directing and what what you're not supposed to do and blah 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 blah. And one actor, British actor that I worked with, um, said that to me. I was I was trying to come up with basically I wanted him angrier. But there were all these detours because I couldn't say the word angry. So it had to be like, what if this morning you woke up and it was just noisy and and, and you didn't sleep well, what would that do to the... And for an hour and a half, we would try to... Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and at some point he was like, do you want me angry? I was like, yeah. I was like, tell me you want me angry. And since then, I'm, I'm trying to be less afraid of doing things that are being labeled bad directing if it just so obviously gets you to the result faster. So I, I still have in the back of my mind how the, uh, what the optimum scenario is, but especially in TV with the time constraints, um, somehow sometimes you just don't have the time. And in TV it's also less frowned upon to just, I think it's already, they appreciate if you have a clear uh, vision, if you have a clear idea what you want in that scene, 
um, and then you can just express it. You don't have to lead them there without saying those things. So maybe in that way it has changed a little bit. What do you enjoy most about your career? That I get to work on stuff that then brings something into the world that didn't exist before. I think just the creative process. If I, if I would be, it's a hard thought for me that I could do a job where I don't create anything and at the end it's just, not that those are not, not um, valid careers, but if I worked in a bank I wouldn't see that result. The world wouldn't be obviously a different place, it would probably be, but I wouldn't see how the world is a different place now that I've been doing something in it rather than if I didn't exist kind of a thing. Um, so I really enjoy that. Um, that every minute that I spend working is an investment in my career, but also an investment in creating something out of thin air and breathing life into it. And doing that with other creative people, of which a lot of them have the same, feel the same kind of rush doing it. That's maybe the greatest part. Did you ever have a day job where you had to just not really create, you're just... Uh just like internships and things and I was or being an assistant in a casting office. I suck at that stuff. It's like, and it's also a lot harder because it always sounds as if the higher jobs in the film industry are the harder ones and the lower you get, the easier it gets. The hardest job that I've ever had was as a PA because you can't make mistakes. As a director, if I make mistakes, nobody notices on the day, maybe nobody ever notices in the editing room and I can make up for it in, in the editing room most of the time. If I make a mistake as a PA, the crew doesn't have breakfast. There's no hiding. It's very clear you've screwed up. So, you know, and that pressure, like I, I sleep much better directing than I would being a PA, you know. So maybe it's a personality thing, but I would not be good at a day job, I think. What are some common myths about being a film or television director? That you are the creative, that you're the creative authority and force behind stuff. Like the, 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 the myth is that the director is this genius and the writer somehow is not or whatever. It's very clear that the hardest thing is to come up with a great story and the director is then only the one who finds the best way of telling that story and translating it to screen. But the creative genius, and I don't want to poo-poo on my fellow, fellow directors, there are genius directors out there, but the, the writer is the, the one that came up with the spark. And if we're talking about creating something out of nothing, who literally created something out of nothing. So I would say, 95% of the credit should go to the writer, 5% should go to the director. The math is wrong because there should also be some for the actors and everybody else. But it is, it's weird for me to say, see, I don't know how it happened. Maybe it's just a personality thing that directors tend to be more boisterous and somehow more, I don't know, grandstanding or something. But how the directors became the kings, the alleged kings of the filmmaking world rather than the writers, I have no idea. So in that case, the, the television world reflects that the reality to me a little bit better even where the writer clearly is the king and the director isn't. What about the, when the director puts themselves in the film? How do you feel about that? In a documentary setting? or oh, no, as a, no, in a narrative. I have no, no strong feelings as long as the fact that they do that doesn't compromise the quality of the film itself. Like if it's if it takes you out of the film and I'm like, oh, that is so-and-so, then that'd be bad. But if they're a good enough actor that they can fit in, I understand the thrill of literally putting, because you're putting so much of yourself into that stuff anyway, but it's invisible, to suddenly break that wall and enter the world of your film literally and physically for a moment, I totally understand why that is um, interesting. It has nothing to do with, oh, look at me or with an arrogance or, or something. I would totally, if I were a better actor and I could just be for a second, go walk you know, through and do something, I would totally do that just out of a juvenile thrill <laughs> of, of, you know, yeah. So I have, I have nothing, nothing against that at all. Yeah. 
like the scene in Was It Staying Alive that John Travolta bumps uh, Sylvester Stallone for one minute on the street and, you know, hey, oh, what do you, you know, is this like this quick thing, but a necessary death? You, you weren't? I was in there for uh, a split second, okay. but that was only because my voice was coming from behind the camera throughout the film, which was important to me that I could could change events in the moment by actually participating in them as the documentarian. So that then when we needed that documentarian on screen, they would have needed my voice and my accent and all that anyway. So I was like, then I'll just do it myself. Um, and it was so short though, because everybody else around me, they're such better actors than I am, that we kept it very, very short so that it doesn't take you out of, out of the whole thing. How has the popularity of the internet affected what you do? That's an interesting question. I don't know if it has or not that I'm aware of at all. Would, would my movies look any different if they were made in a pre-internet era? I wouldn't be able to, I mean, obviously I couldn't check Twitter afterwards to see how people felt about certain aspects. But other than that, I don't have a feeling, other than maybe an awareness that you're competing with even more uh, stuff that's being offered with YouTube and with all those things. Um, and that, that people's patience because of that is it's much shorter than it used to be. But I don't know if, if in another way it's that affected by it. Do you think uh, any of the desires to tell certain stories have changed? I mean, it's like we used to turn on 60 minutes back in the day to see an expose on something and, and it was exciting and you'd hear the clock ticking and all that. I mean, now all we have to do is just pick up the phone for one second right. and look for a notification and to see something tragic happen or something amazing happened, right. or some celebrity has a, an opinion on something. And, you know, I used yeah. to see Mike Wallace sit down and like really grill somebody. And right, 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 right. <laughs> now I think that is maybe why it's a little bit immune to that is that long form storytelling process, which so far hasn't been that affected by it. The, the, the 90 minute to two hour arc has the, the, the internet has not yet dismantled that. They have all the short form is there and the Vine and the, you know, all the Snapchat, everything, which I think now more companies are starting to cater to that, to tell their stories in 20 second or two minute chunks or something for the internet generation. But so far what I'm doing has been a little bit immune against that because it always dealt with the long form that has not been that influenced by the internet. Looking back now on your career, why are you still here in Hollywood? Well, what stories do you still want to tell? Why does it still drive you to be here? You talked about ambition for this one character that you were thinking of and, and how you were either not like that character or you were. Right. I mean, the, the very superficial level is really that this is one of the only places in the world where you can make a living doing what you love, if filmmaking is doing what you love. Um, but then also it's a very high standard of professionalism in the town, obviously, the, the crews you get here, um, the, the creative talent that is here. And you have to have so many meetings to make, like you have to have 100 meetings with different production companies for them to, for one project to then actually get off the ground, that I don't know how you would do that living anywhere else, because you'd have to fly into Los Angeles constantly to kind of have meetings. So. At the moment, I don't see any other place in the world that I could live um, and be a professional filmmaker. But that might well be possible. I just, I have no experience with it. So, plus I have a family here now. I like Los Angeles as a city, which I know is very unpopular thing to say. I really like it. Um, and I don't know why I would want to live anywhere else. Yeah, it's interesting because I look back on, um, I told you I was watching this Raymond Chandler documentary. And you know he wrote about LA as someone from the UK, uh -huh. and uh, romanticized a lot of it. I know he talked about you know the the, the crime, criminal element, but um, th there are many parts of it that you leave and you're like, I miss that. I I would miss having access to so many things right, right. at my fingertips. So yes, the traffic is terrible, um, and, and there's it's very crowded. But yeah, there's so much here. And it's also very beautiful. It, yeah. Parts of it are incredibly right. beautiful. Yeah. So I know sometimes we focus on what I feel like is too much negativity on LA, and you know I've been guilty of that. 
but uh, there, there are some really fantastic things about the city. Yeah, okay. And you can walk to so much. But um, back in Germany, watching these films, whether it was a dubbed version of, you know, Carrie Fisher delivering right. a line right. in Star Wars, did you know you were coming here? Was no. that a plan? No. I went to film school just for writing. I came from the Dungeons and Dragons field, which was my favorite game, still is my favorite game. Um, just the rush of being able to create something out of nothing, just because there's a group of people sitting around making something up, suddenly it exists for everybody, it was mesmerizing to me. So I thought, how can I do that professionally? Writing was the answer, so I was looking for a writing program, which happened to be the film school in Germany. And so I did the whole screenwriting program, and that's kind of where the filmmaking bug got to me a little bit. Because it felt weird that there's another person marching in, suddenly taking my story and being the director and whatever, when I'm like, I've already I've got that story in my head, why would I need someone else to tell it to the actor, or the production designer, and the cinematographer and stuff. And then I came here for directing. So I was 20 or something when I realized that I was going to make films. My, the, my teenage self didn't know that yet. If you were to go back and give yourself advice, what would you say to yourself? Even if it's just some like very quick sort of flippant advice. Stay away from a certain producer that completely destroyed a movie that I did, which had a very harsh impact on my career. That's not very good advice for anyone else watching, but if I have to be honest, I would have to spot one thing where I was like, but I also didn't have any influence over, over whom the movie was being sold to. So I don't know if I should have pulled out. Looking back now, I would probably pull out before I make the movie, but I didn't know that then, and I can't blame myself for not knowing that then. But that would be the one piece of advice that I would give myself. I think anybody who's been in an industry long enough has probably had a story or two like that. Right. And so you don't know at that time, you right. have no idea. And I also don't want to blame everything on it, like, oh, I'd be making blockbusters now if that one experience hadn't happened. But it, it, it's, it was a very tangible moment where things went very differently from the path that everything else was kind of lining up to be. But obviously there's no good in sitting at home and going like, I've been wronged, you know, that just happens. I've also had a lot of luck with a lot of stuff, so I guess that's just how it goes. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. What are the stories you want to tell? I don't know if I have specific kinds of stories I want to tell. I just want to tell good, surprising, smart stories. I think it's almost more about the how to tell the stories than what, what to tell in the stories, which goes back to, I don't know if I have one big message for the world, which is why I don't tweet, I have nothing <laughs> to, to say to the world that the world needs to know. It's the same with a movie. I don't know if I'm in possession of any truth that will change the world if I just can get the world to hear it. And it's the one story that keeps me uh, awake at night. It's really just about trying to make stories that, that really have an impact on you in, as a viewer in the moment. That to me is kind of the my goal to which I'm responsible for my craft, basically. And what what happened in the bigger context of, of which messages are being put out in the world, I don't think that I'm a filmmaker that rises to the level of I am putting um, stuff out into the world that is of any significance in terms of political change, social change, all of that. My, my cosmos is kind of smaller and more intimate and is more the authenticity of the human experience in the moment of the of this of the individual in the moment and i'm pretty happy in that field <laughs>